Good morning, everyone. This is the public hearing and public meeting of the Committee of the Whole regarding bills numbers 240179, 240180, 240181, 240182, and resolution number 240193. Well, Ms. Longhead, will you please take the roll for all members who are in attendance? Council Member Squilla. Council Member Gautier. Councilmember Jones, Councilmember Young, Councilmember Driscoll, Councilmember Lazada, Councilmember Bass, Councilmember Phillips, Councilmember Gilmore Richardson, Councilmember Thomas, Councilmember Harity, Councilmember Ahmad, Councilmember Landau, Councilmember Brooks. Council Member O'Rourke, Council President Johnson. Present. Thank you. A quorum of the committee is present, and this hearing is now called to order. Ms. Loghead, will you please read the title of the resolutions? Bill number 240179, an ordinance to adopt the operating budget for fiscal year 2025. Bill number 240180, an ordinance amending Chapter 19, 1800 of the Philadelphia Code entitled School Tax Authorization to provide for an increase in the tax that the Board of Education of the School District of Philadelphia is authorized to impose on real estate, and amending Chapter 19, 1300 entitled Real Estate Taxes to establish an equivalent reduction in the tax rate for the city real estate tax in making technical changes all under certain terms and conditions. Bill number 240181, an ordinance to adopt a fiscal year 2025 capital budget. Bill number 240182, an ordinance to adopt a capital program for the six years 2025-2030 inclusive. Resolution 240193, providing for the approval by the Council of the City of Philadelphia of a revised five-year financial plan for the City of Philadelphia covering fiscal years 2025 through 2029 and incorporating revisions with respect to fiscal year 2024 which is to be submitted by the mayor to the Pennsylvania Intergovernmental Cooperation Authority pursuant to an intergovernmental cooperation agreement by and between the city and the authority. Also present is Councilman Jamie Gardier, Councilman Brian O'Neill, and Councilman Nina Ahmad. Also Councilman Cindy Bass, Today we begin the public hearing of the Committee of the Whole to consider the bills read by the clerk that constitute proposed operating and capital spending measures for fiscal year 2025, a capital program and a forward-looking capital plan for fiscal year 2025 through fiscal year 2030. Today we will hear testimony from the administration on the five-year plan. Ms. Lockhead, will you please call the first witness to testify from the administration? The first person to testify from the administration is Tiffany Thurman, Chief of Staff to Mayor Parker. Good morning. Um, could you just please state um, your name and title for the record and then you can Proceed with your testimony. Good morning. Good morning, Council President Johnson. My name is Tiffany Thurman, and I'm the Chief of Staff to Mayor Parker. I'm joined by my colleagues, Chief Deputy Mayor Sinceri Harris and Aaron Platt. With us today are Finance Director Rob DeBow, Cabinet members, and Department heads from across the administration. We are grateful for the opportunity to testify on Resolution 240193 in support of the city's five-year plan for fiscal years 2025 through 2029. The mayor has a bold vision for the city's future to make Philadelphia the safest, cleanest, and greenest big city in America with economic opportunity for all. And her one Philly budget features significant investments and new ways of doing business to achieve it. The mayor's proposed five-year plan includes $850 million in new operating investments and nearly $1.2 billion in new capital investments for a total of $2 billion in new targeted investments. 
As the mayor puts it, the budget comes from the ground up and reflects the voices of Philadelphians, the countless community members, small business owners, and faith leaders she's talked with over the campaign trail, the hundreds of volunteers who advised her transition, and the frontline city employees she has seen up close in action since taking office. The budget also responds to the city's fiscal conditions, including a shifting revenue picture and legacy challenges. It maintains positive fund balances and sets aside funds in the budget stabilization reserve, reserve fund while navigating through the end of the American Rescue Plan Act funding and a legacy pension obligation bond balloon payment due in the final year of the plan. We're gonna to speak to a few of the key investments and new approaches through which Mayor Parker's first budget advances her bold vision for the city and makes good on her call for one Philly, a united city. Public safety. Public safety is the mayor's top priority. The FY25 budget includes over $33 million in new operating investments, with over $150 million over the five-year plan for public safety. This is on top of significant baseline funding along with major capital investments. Public Police Commissioner Kevin Bethel, Managing Director Adam Teal, and Chief Public Safety Director Adam Gear are developing a comprehensive strategy with new ways of approaching long-standing challenges. Key levers of the strategy supported by the budget include increasing the number and frequency of new police department recruiting classes, assigning new recruits to footbeats in neighborhoods and commercial corridors across the city, and investing in community policing further reducing violent crime by deploying personnel more strategically with more officers in the field, addressing 911 staffing issues and making technology upgrades for more effective investigations. New resources and attention to persistent quality of life issues, including illegal use of all-terrain vehicles, car meetups, retail theft, and nuisance businesses. Addressing open air drug markets starting in Kensington through a multi-phase initiative including resident engagement, enforcement, and restoration with the overarching goal of increasing public safety and community health for people who live and work in Kensington. Creating new triage and wellness facilities as part of the administration's effort to provide quality treatment care and housing for the city's most vulnerable, including those suffering with addiction, homelessness, and mental health challenges. I'll turn it over now to my colleague, Chief Deputy Mayor Sinceri Harris, to discuss the budget's investments in clean and green and education. Thank you, Tiffany. Good morning, Council President Johnson, members of City Council. My name is Sinceri Harris, and I serve as the Chief Deputy Mayor for Sustainability, Intergovernmental Affairs, and Engagement. Let's talk clean and green. In keeping with the Mayor's pledge to make Philadelphia the cleanest and greenest big city in America, this represents the single largest area of new investments, with more than $36 million in new operating investments for FY25, and over $246 million over the course of the five-year plan. The mayor is prioritizing how city government addresses persistent quality of life issues, from litter and blight to illegal dumping and abandoned cars, not to mention tackling the historic disparity in how those issues are addressed through a new approach that responds first to hardest hit neighborhoods. Those investments and new approaches include appointing Carlton Williams to a new cabinet level position, the director of clean and green initiatives, and charging him with leading an all-hands effort to clean and green the city. A new citywide residential cleaning program with dedicated cleaning crews for every single council manic district and one point of contact for members to call for a response of, to quality life concerns. Expanding PHL TCB, PHL taking care of business program to additional commercial corridors and into residential areas next to those targeted corridors while pairing this with expanded cleaning support from sanitation. We're piloting twice weekly trash collection by sanitation in areas facing the most challenging trash and litter conditions. 
We're increasing the number of illegal dumping crews in order to shorten response time, adding a special collection crew for bulk pickup and expanding the city's network of surveillance cameras in illegal dumping hotspots and using data to provide where to deliver services and, and, imp and to improve how those services are delivered. Now turning from cleaning to greening, a topic near and dear to my heart, this one Philly budget includes a focus on environmental justice for underserved and under-resourced communities, backed up by cleaner neighborhoods, more green spaces, planting over 15,000 trees, and meeting the city's carbon neutrality goal all of which will result in fewer urban heat islands in a healthier, more resilient, and healthier, more resilient communities. Continued, investing, continued investment in restoring and improving our community parks, libraries, and rec centers through Rebuild, which is now under Capital Programs Office. And increasing funding to SEPTA by over $117 million, recognizing the essential role that public transit plays in building resilient and sustainable communities. Moving to education. To accelerate progress towards the mayor's goals of providing all students a world-class education, the FY25 budget includes over 24 million in new operating investments for education, with nearly 140 million in new investments over the five-year plan. Now of that, 129 million is for the school district, funded through a combination of shifting the district's share of the real estate tax from 55% to 56% and increasing the city's local contribution directly to the school district. In addition to the new funding, the budget introduces new approaches to address long-standing challenges. It supports the Mayor's Office of Education to plan and provide oversight for a multi-year rollout of the Mayor's full-day, year-round school initiative. This will enable students to receive the educational enrichment they need throughout the school year with a schedule that works for working families. Taking on another sizable challenge, the Mayor's Office of Education will convene leaders across sectors to devise an actionable plan for school building modernization. This is a big one, and this complex undertaking will require close coordination across all levels of government. Now with that, I turn to my colleague, Aaron, Pl Aaron Platt, to discuss economic opportunity and housing. Thank you, Sinceri. Good morning, Council President Johnson and Council members. My name is Aaron Platt. Chief Deputy Mayor of Planning and Strategic Initiatives. The promise the mayor made to the city of Philadelphia is that our city will be one that delivers economic opportunity for all. Practically speaking, that means that government should be a booster, not a barrier to economic growth and job creation across every demographic and socioeconomic group. Her budget includes nearly $20 million in new operating investments for economic opportunity in FY25 and over $130 million during the five-year plan. I'm going to share some examples of how the budget helps expand access to economic, economic opportunity through workforce development, cross-sector collaboration, and capital investments. The budget includes $10 million for workforce development and apprenticeship programs. We'll train working-class Philadelphians for careers and in industries that are thriving today and those that are projected to grow, like the building trades, logistics, life sciences, and biotech. The funding will be, a bit, will be available only for programs that offer guaranteed employment to graduates. The mayor wants to make sure that Philadelphia leads the nation in life sciences and biotech, and this funding will help get us there. The budget supports new models of cross-sector collaboration, business, faith-based, and intergovernmental mayoral roundtables. The business roundtable, for example, will include working groups focused on areas with high potential for aligning strategy, expanding equitable access to opportunity, and attracting additional public, private, and philanthropic investments. We have launched the new Office of Minority Business Success, whose director is in the mayor's cabinet. She reports directly to the mayor. The office's mission is to bolster minority business enterprises, MBEs, and, other and others in Philadelphia by creating a thriving entrepreneurial ecosystem, aligning businesses with available opportunities, and identifying sources of patient capital. But Mayor Parker knows that we can't have a thriving city unless we address the city's critical housing needs. That's why the mayor has set a goal of producing 30,000 more homes for households that need them. New homes for homeowners, rehabbing and building buildings for renters, and revitalizing and repairing homes to enable long-time occupants to stay where they are living. 
The FY25-29 plan makes a series of strategic investments and changes how we work to move toward this goal. The budget supports continuation of successful housing production programs, such as Turn the Key. It also provides needed staffing capacity to ensure that all city-supported new housing is affordable luxury, with the kind of high-quality fixtures and finishes everyone wants for their homes in affordable housing. The administration is committed to tackling barriers and cost delays to housing development, including at the land bank. And the budget supports continuing investment in city-funded home repair programs, and will make it much easier to access these programs through a single home improvement application to let folks apply for multiple programs at a single time. But to accomplish the mayor's ambitious goals requires a shared commitment to delivering visible results for residents, a willingness to build on what is working and change what does not, and a dedicated, talented city workforce equipped with the training, resources, and back office support to do their best work. Accordingly, the mayor's proposed FY25 budget includes $14 million in new operating investments for needed core support, with close to $131 million, $151 million during the five-year plan. And now, I'd like to turn it back to Tiffany Thurman. Thank you, Aaron. We look forward to partnering with City Council in finalizing a fiscal year 2025 budget that helps to ensure Philadelphia's best days are ahead of it. Thank you for the opportunity to present our testimony. We have also submitted testimony for the Mayor's Office and for the Department of Labor. Mr. President, I'd like to ask Martine DeCamp to present testimony on the fiscal year 2025 capital budget and fiscal year 2025 to fiscal year 2030 capital program, after which we and our colleagues here today are available to any, answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Council, Council President Johnson and members of the City Council. I'm Martine DeCamp, Acting Executive Director of the City Planning Commission. Along with my city colleagues, we're here to present for your review and consideration the recommended FY 2025 to 2030 capital program and FY 2025 capital budget. These were approved by the City Planning Commission on March 12, 2024. The Parker Administration's inaugural recommended capital program and budget strive to make Philadelphia the safest, cleanest, and greenest big city in America with economic opportunity for all. The recommended program is a six-year plan for investing in the city's physical and technology infrastructure, neighborhood and community facilities, city-owned buildings, and specialized vehicles. The recommended budget reflects the spending appropriations for the first year of the six-year program. As both the program and budget are key instruments of planned physical development, the Philadelphia Home Rule Charter directs that their initial preparation and submission to the mayor be a function of the City Planning Commission. Beginning in early fall of last year, the staff of the City Planning Commission and the Budget Office received and evaluated requests from 20 departments. We then worked with department heads and managers to produce a capital program and budget that addresses our capital needs, aligns with administrative priorities, and reflects our financial resources and spending capacity. The recommended six-year capital program calls for over $1.4 billion of new city tax-supported general obligation bond funding to support public improvements throughout Philadelphia. When possible, city funds are used to leverage additional resources provided by our greatly appreciated regional, state, federal, and private partners. We are also taking steps to strategically leverage our limited city appropriations to capital with federal and state grants, such as the bipartisan infrastructure legislation. Considering all sources of funding, including self-sustaining aviation and water funds and carry-forward appropriations from previous years, the recommended capital program proposes $16.2 billion of additional improvements. For FY 2025, the recommended capital budget calls for $295.7 million of new general obligation bond funding, which is slightly higher than recent budget years. The recommended budget makes critical infrastructure investments while reflecting the city's financial constraints and ability to support new debt service. The FY 25 to 30 recommended capital program and budget include 
$146.1 million in FY25 and $471 million over the full program for public safety. Investments in health and wellness triage facilities, recreational facilities, police and fire facilities, fire vehicles, prison infrastructure, local bridge reconstruction, and street lighting and traffic improvements are recommended to increase public safety and build mutual trust in our neighborhoods. $44 million in FY25 and $212.9 million over the full program for clean and green. Funding for city parks, playgrounds and pools, trail improvements, electric vehicle infrastructure, and other energy efficiency improvements are recommended to improve the quality of life in Philadelphia and make all neighborhoods clean, green, and vibrant. $37.6 million in FY25 and $169.7 million over the full program for economic opportunity. Funding for neighborhood commercial corridors, shelter facilities, public transit, I-95 roadway improvements, and industrial and waterfront land redevelopment are requested to invest in economic opportunity for all. $16.8 million in FY25 and $126.3 million over the full program for education. Funding for city-owned free library, zoo, and art museum facilities are requested to invest in education for Philadelphians of all ages and socioeconomic backgrounds. $51.1 million in FY25 and $430.3 million over the full program for core support. Support for IT infrastructure, street repaving, ADA ramp reconstruction, and improvements to municipal buildings are rec recommended to invest in more efficient and effective municipal services. We're pleased to propose these investments, but we know they do not include all the projects the departments requested. And while the amount of recommended new general obligation bond funded spending in this year's capital program and budget exceeds previous years, there remains a lot of documented need. New general obligation bond funding spending in future years remains limited. Increasing city borrowing will mean increasing debt service and fixed costs, reducing the city's budgetary flexibility. Overall, given our financial constraints, the administration feels the recommended capital program and budget invests in the city's infrastructure to the greatest extent possible. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. We'd be happy to address any questions you may have. Uh, please note that the leaders of the city departments are present to assist in answering questions. Thank you. Thank you very much and thank all of you for your testimony. For the record, I want to acknowledge um, Councilman Mark Squillo, who's present, as well as Councilman Catherine Gilmore Richardson. Um, before we start our round of um, questionings for this particular process, I have a couple questions, um, starting with um, the five-year plan and its fiscal health. Um, just for the record, on the five-year plan cites that the budget proposal is in response to the city's fiscal conditions, which include the following challenges, a $300 million reduction in wage and real estate transfer tax compared to the prior five-year plan, the end of the American Rescue Plan funding in FY25, and a legacy pension obligation bond in the following year of the plan. While this plan does continue payments to the budget stabilization reserve, they are 20 million lower than the prior plan and the fund balance of 14 million in the FY29 is less than 1% of revenues. With these challenges to our city's fiscal health, the FY25 through 29 five-year plan shows spending outpacing revenues in every year of the plan. What is the administration's plan to become structurally balanced during the course of this plan? Good morning, Rob Dubo, finance director. Uh, you know, any plan is a trade-off between um, a whole bunch of things that you're trying to, to balance, you know, fiscal stability versus essential investments. We really thought that the investments laid out in this plan are crucial for the future of the city. It will put us on a track where it um, will help stimulate our economy. People want to come here so that in the long run, we would see healthier balances than what this plan shows, and we would see you know, structural balance going forward. I think that's probably particularly true as we head past FY29 and we see things like um, our debt service fall you know, precipitously in FY30. What's our overall plan to drive economic growth as well, um, doing the five-year plan as well? So um, our plan is, a big part of our plan is to make Philadelphia a more attractive place. Um, and that is laid out with a lot of the investments that we show. 
Um, for example, investments in public safety, investments in clean and green. Um, we also have um, substantial investments in, in workforce development you know, to prepare people for working in the city. We have investments in education, which helps you know, the long-term economic development of the city. So really a whole number of things can put together to, to help make the city grow. In terms of, of the development of this process um, regarding the five-year plan, what strategies was used to make sure that this process is equitable from a budgetary standpoint to make sure that all Philadelphians have an opportunity to participate, but most importantly, feel the investments in this particular five-year plan as it relates to the budget? Thank you, Council President. You're welcome. When the mayor spoke about economic opportunity for all, she, she, she knew what she was talking about. She sat in this chamber, she's worked on legislation. Whether we're talking about housing equity, whether we're talking about business equity, whether we're talking about programs that she supported as a member of council, like the Walter P. Lomax uh, Transparency and Business Bill. We are following the lead of our mayor, who truly, truly believes in this and baked into every aspect that we are presenting here today is economic opportunity so that we're not creating an environment that allows only a few to, to bear in the good fortunes of our city's next step, but one that truly lifts everybody, that has an eye toward the fact that this city is one of the poorest, if not the poorest big city in the nation. And ways to truly reverse this, whether it's the Office of Minority Business Success, the work that's being done in commerce, the work that's being done around housing, the work that's being done around workforce development, education, I could go on. But I can assure you, Council President, baked into everything is economic. Absolutely. In terms of the actual budget process, were departments engaged in coming up with uh, an equitable rubric per each department to show that uh, we're, we're addressing issues of economic disparity based upon each individual department. Yes, I'll start and then uh, Rob, you can jump in. Um, so yes, every department was engaged. Uh, they submitted first their uh, initial request and then uh, our finance department with our budget team and of course our team here sat down to ensure that there was alignment um, around um, our equi economic opportunity goals and also goals around uh, racial equity and inclusion, ensuring yes. that um, one of the things that we say is that we're not looking at a, a half a loaf, but that we that we uh, have we extend the whole pie, right? So that we are looking at uh, we're taking a comprehensive approach across all departments and ensuring that we are serving. Um, people that have traditionally you know, not been served and not been taken into consideration uh, during the budget process. When we talk about education um, and the investment of the 24 million and 100 plus million over five years, could you talk about the support for um, pre-K, um, making sure that every young person in the city of Philadelphia receive a high quality um, early childhood education and talk about um, the investment um, in this budget in terms of dollars and cents. Yes, I'd like to actually call up our Chief Deputy Managing Director, Vanessa Garrett-Harley, to take that question. Good morning. Good morning, Vanessa. Vanessa. How are you? I'm great. This is Vanessa Garrett Harley, Chief Deputy Mayor for the Office of Children and Families. And I'm sorry, Council Press, could you repeat that question? So we talk about the support for um, public education. I noticed that there wasn't a um, significant um, investment for FY25 for pre-K, right? It's an initiative that um, a lot of members in the side of this body supported under your last administration based upon the importance of all young people um, getting a quality um, pre-K education and just wanted to get an idea of um, the investment uh, wasn't listed as an increase for FY25. I just want to kind of get an idea where we're at on that particular issue. Understood. So the investment in pre-K is basically remaining stable. Um, for FY25, we currently have 5,250 pre-K seats, um, and we're happy that we have a fill rate of over 
Um, at this point, we have about 223 locations that are over the 43 zip codes. We are very intentional about making sure that we are putting them in priority neighborhoods, as we call it. There's a whole formula that we utilize that considers a, a my rate of factors, including everything from teen mothers to low maternal education, insufficient prenatal care, even the gun violence in the community in order to determine where the need is greater, and we try to prioritize those areas. The decision around holding where we are is because we are doing so well with pre-K where we are and filling our pre-K seats, we're moving forward now with trying to enhance the universal um, early childhood education system for the city. And that universal system means that we are also working with the school district as well as the state and the Fed. You know, there's pre-K counts, and then there's also um, Head Start um, seats in the city. We're trying to maximize those seats all across the board, and we're actually coming up with one universal application to make things easier for uh, families as they are trying to apply. Right now, if you apply for pre-K, you do one application for us, you gotta do something different for Head Start, something different for pre-K counts, and a family shouldn't have to go through those kind of changes. We are excited that this will launch early spring. So really, uh, hopefully by the end of April, beginning of May, we will actually launch that one universal application and then we can um, put them wherever they are. It will also allow our partners to help maximize seats that they have not filled. Our flow rate is higher than most of our other partners, but so that's where we are and that's why we're holding because we're building that whole universal system so that across the ecosystem for pre-K for the city, um, we'll be prepared to move forward. I, th I think that's awesome, definitely streamlining the process. Um, just elaborate on how are you differentiating between the high quality seats versus those seats aren't high quality. Because I remember when we started the pre-K um, initiative, one of the key issues were making sure that young people and families had an opportunity to go to the highest quality um, early childhood learning centers um, in the city of Philadelphia. That's what made the program special and a little bit different than what the district offers as well as um, the pre-K counts initiatives offered on the state level. So could you just elaborate on that part just to make sure as we go down that path, individual families still know that even though it's streamlined, they still have that opportunity to still go to a high quality pre-K Absolutely. Program. So uh, proud to say that now about 96% of our pre-K seats are what is called high quality using the state uh, Keystone Star system. Um, and when, so we now have even been exploring bringing in um, uh, providers who may not be high quality, but we provide technical assistance and help them raise to the high quality level. And so um, th this means that across the system, the lion's share of the seats are high quality. And even where we have pre-K seats, many of them are in facilities that also have the Head Start and the uh, pre-K count seats anyway. So you're getting that same level of quality in the seats. But the quality assurance measures that we have in place will definitely be there. In fact, they'll become more robust as we're building technical assistance and we help those providers if they need help to build to a higher level. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm gonna have to open this up to my members and I'll have an opportunity to address a lot of other questions I may have as relates to the different departments. But I did have one question regarding the triage centers. Just give us an idea. I know the Kensington Caucus is very, um, aggressive and, and, and compassionate and supportive of making sure we improve the quality of life in um, the Kensington community. And, and, and I think they're having some, some great headway in terms of um, addressing the issue. And so can you just give an idea of what triage centers would look like, um, the number, the amount of investment um, that's going into triage centers, and just give us an overview of what that looks like in terms of how we move forward in terms of addressing the opioid crisis and addiction crisis here in the city of Philadelphia. Absolutely, Council President. I'd like to call up our Managing Director, Adam Teal, who can answer that question for you. Thank you. Good morning, Council President and Council Members. I'm Adam Teal, the Managing Director now for the City of Philadelphia. Uh, Council President, the vision for these triage and wellness centers is, is really bold and obviously backed by an unprecedented proposed investment. So we are looking at ensuring that we have facilities where we can triage folks who need city services, uh, who are currently experiencing a lot of different 
uh, types of ills, whether that's temporarily experiencing homelessness, whether it's substance use disorder, and ensuring that we are able to, to wrap around those folks and get them the help they need, not just in the short term. We know that city workers and our partners are out there 24-7, 365, saving lives. And we are absolutely going to continue that work. At the same time, we know, and, and I know from experience wearing my former hat here in the city of Philadelphia, that we need to build out the rest of that system to ensure that folks, once we save their lives and once we have them stable, that we can continue that through short, medium, and ultimately in the long term. So making sure that folks get the long-term care, treatment, and housing they need. The specifics of this very bold plan uh, are still under development. We are doing due diligence in a number of different possibilities and uh, also talking with a number of different providers about how we're going to partner to staff these facilities and, of course, ensure that all of this is done in full synchronization with our law enforcement, health, and mental health providers, that entire ecosystem. The last thing I'll say, uh, Council President, is Mayor Parker, during her first 100 days, just to show her commitment to this, uh, convened, apparently for the first time, uh, all of our health systems, payers, providers, in the same room, uh, right here in the conversation hall. We had healthcare system CEOs, we had providers from all types of organizations sitting together to talk about, start this dialogue about how we can collectively build out this entire system uh, to take care of folks. A very positive meeting. We are continuing that. We're having additional convenings with payers, additional convenings with health systems providers, so we make sure that we can get these additional capabilities, these triage and wellness centers set up as quickly as possible. Again, uh, subject to your support, so we can take care of folks, again, 24-7, 365 for as long as they need get them jobs, make sure they have that economic opportunity, and um, help them move forward. That's a comprehensive approach. I think that's awesome. Um, how many triage centers will be proposed? Well, Council President, some of that depends on the level of funding uh, that's provided uh, by City Council. Uh, the mayor has really proposed, I mean, this is a bold investment. We still see this as seed money. Uh, we think that this is going to be a very attractive uh, opportunity as folks see this success for our philanthropic partners, potentially other levels of government, you've heard the mayor talking about uh, intergovernmental cooperation and collaboration. So we certainly want to talk with our state and federal colleagues about uh, helping us with this uh, successful program. Uh, so we think ultimately the answer to that question is going to depend on the level of investment. We want to get started. We have the resources uh, in this proposal to get started. So uh, we hope that you will help support this. When you say seed money, what's the proposed level of investment for the triage centers as it stands right now? Well, the, pro the proposed capital investment is on the order of $100 million. Okay. And uh, again, we think this is going to be, I mean, this is really a bold plan. We think this is what is needed. There are a lot of other cities that are sort of, I think, as I, we look at this, uh, doing a lot of things around the margins and kind of taking an incremental approach. Uh, we're not sure that's going to work uh, at this point. So this is... Uh, a very aggressive strategy, and we're hoping to grow that $100 million initial investment into something greater, as well as, of course, there's an operating investment that goes along with that to provide all the types of supports that we need to operate these facilities, to work with our providers, to staff those facilities, and give folks high-quality care, treatment, and housing with dignity for as long as they need it to get on their feet, get jobs, and move forward. Thank you very much. At this time, I'm going to allow um, members to begin speaking. Councilmember Isaiah Thomas. Good morning, Council President. Um, I'm going to say from the beginning that this is just going to be my first round. I'll come back for a second round because I don't think I'm going to get it all in. Um, I want to start by um, acknowledging all of the young people who are here today. If you don't know, a lot of our schools are in spring break. There's a lot of high school students who came down today to listen to their government in action. They're all over the room. So I want to start by acknowledging them um, and thank all the council members who allowed 
young people to intern with them uh, throughout the course of this week so that they can complete their requirements to be able to graduate from high school. Young people, welcome to your government in action. Um, I started with young people because that is really my passion. And I understand that this administration is really focused on public safety. And when you think about the crime in the city of Philadelphia, a large amount of the crime is being committed by young people between the ages of 14 and 24. I do think that the admin has made some um, excellent pledges as it relates to things that the admin wants to commit to, to provide young people with quality opportunities, but I do have some concerns. In your budget testimony today, the first thing that jumped off the uh, 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 paper to me was this idea of, of capital investment in schools. Uh, last year, uh, my team as the Chair of the Education Committee put out a proposal where we recommended that a third, a, a third authority be responsible for building new buildings. We know that the school district don't have the capacity. Uh, Josh Shapiro tweeted, I believe last week, that uh, uh, Harrisburg has an $11 billion surplus right now if they fund every proposal that was submitted to the governor. If we do not act right now as it relates to addressing the crisis dealing with our schools, um, how can we assure that there will be money there in the future? Let me give you some things that's going on in the schools that you might not know. Several times a month, young people are asked to leave their building because of the issue with their school. Some of the things that have been communicated to us, power outages, um, issues related to hair, uh, heat and air, and of course, what we all know about asbestos. The governor proposed about uh, between 102 million, 100 and 200 million in new capital dollars for the entire Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And when you break those numbers down, that's not even enough to address the issues at Frankfurt High School for the city of Philadelphia. Frankfurt alone has about a $40 million bill as it relates to capital needs to address that specific school. So I'm wondering, what is the plan to be able to put us in a position to receive capital dollars to really put a dent in the facilities crisis here in the city of Philadelphia? So I'll, I'll start, and then I'd like to call up uh, Dr. Uh, Deb Carrera, our new chief education officer, who um, can add uh, additional information. So we are definitely supporting um, a school building modernization plan that we do in coordination with the school district and other parties. And so we're working with Dr. Watlington and Oz Hill and other leaders at the school district to ensure uh, that we take into consideration uh, previous and, uh, recommendations that have been put forth around schools and the disinvestments that's happened with school buildings. And so um, in addition to that, Dr. Carrera can talk about the additional work and steps that will be taking place um, over the weeks in, to come. Yeah, I, and while Doc is coming up, I wanna be clear. I've spoke with Dr. Watlington, Board President Streeter, and a lot of different parties about this, and we've been talking about this for months. And we understand that the district is focused right now on academic achievement, but we have to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. Absolutely. We're very concerned that the district doesn't have the capacity to build new school buildings. And we understand that this, this bill right now is well over $6 billion. So I think that it's gonna require, and I know that Dr. Watlington and the school board and their team will be coming before us at some point, but I won't be asking them these questions because this is above their pay rate, right? Like they don't have the ability to decide what the process will consist of to build new schools. All they can do is let us know that they don't have the capacity to do it themselves. Dr. Carrera. Yes. Sorry, good morning, Council President, and thank you, Council Thomas. I think to address your last piece, um, in complete agreement with you. So I think that that's really important for us to say. And um, there is a lot of interest about this issue on behalf of the mayor. We wanna make sure that there is a strong presence of council, um, the business community and other stakeholders in developing and supporting the sustainable modernization process. Um, you know, the mayor would like to take a funded first approach where we're focusing on securing necessary funds um, and a long-term term investment in reimagining and renovating our schools. Uh, we know the governor has proposed a $1.5 billion um, initiative over five years to support construction. We know that's not enough, but it's a start. So while our needs are much greater um, than what we want to work, uh, we wanna work to find every funding source possible to support the district's facilities and modernization plan. Additionally, in the governor's budget, there was a uh, $100 million uh, grant um, opportunity for schools as well. And, um, you know, I started March 1st, but I definitely want to be able to, I look forward to talking to you more and to counsel more and your staff and learn more about uh, your question about the school construction um, authority. I think the concern that we have is that 
no one's going to give us money until we give them a plan. And the district doesn't have a facilities plan. I meet with them once a month. We've been pushing this. When Dr. Watlington first got in, the first thing I told him is that we need to focus on facilities. He said his focus was going to be on academic achievement, and I respect that because based on his experiences, um, that's what he knew he could move the needle on. And if you want to look at the numbers, you know, you have to commend Dr. Watlington and his team for the work that's been done post-pandemic as it relates to academic achievement. But with that being said, while we have seen some traction as it relates to academic achievement, we have been taking step backwards as it relates to facilities. My concern is that the funded first model will not work because no one's going to give us a blank check. The governor has made it clear we're not going to get money for new facilities until we tell them what the plan is to build the new facilities. So that part really concerns me uh, first and foremost. And again, the school district themselves don't have a facility plan. Right. And I'm not knocking them for that, but they were in limbo themselves because they're waiting for a new administration to transition. They're waiting for a new school board to transition. So any plan they might have created could have easily been ripped up to shreds if the administration didn't agree with the direction that they wanted to go in. So I want to be clear, Council President and those listening, I'm not knocking the school district of Philadelphia for not having a plan. What I'm doing right now is I'm sounding the alarm. I believe if we do not have a plan for school buildings in this year's budget right now, we will lose an opportunity to be able to gather hundreds of millions of dollars from Harrisburg that could put us in a position to change the school crisis forever. I think if we wait and we address this next year and next year's budget, Harrisburg won't have an $11 billion surplus. All right, so I have to transition because I hear something that's telling me that my time is running low. Last thing I want to say about schools and then I'll move on to economic growth when I come back for my second round. The school district of Philadelphia cannot do anything about the safety issues that exist when young people are traveling to and from school. That's not their responsibility. We have some things in place that we've done around safe corridors and things of that capacity, um, but we cannot say that that's all on them. I'm wondering what is the vision and what specifically is a part of the plan to make sure that young people are safe when they travel to and from schools? One of the things that we talked about was the, the chartered buses for schools. And the school district said that they don't have the authority nor the capacity to assure specifically with high schools, there's a charter bus outside that school that takes those young people to the nearest major uh, bus tra uh, transportation center. So I think about Council Member Bass's district and what happened at MOTEP. Had there been a chartered bus at that school to take all of those young people to Broad and Olney after school every day, uh, um, only the creator knows what might have or have not happened to students. So I, as I close out my first round of questioning, I'm wondering, out of all the things that I read, I don't see anything that specifically talks about the safety of children traveling to and from school. What's the plan? So thank you. Um, I actually, uh, Council Member Thomas, thank you. Um, I, um, I'm heartened by your passion, by your call to action. Um, I would like to call up our uh, police commissioner, uh, Kevin Bethel, to, to answer that question. As he's coming up, um, I do want to note that uh, we had an opportunity, our administration, to go to Imhotep to sit and speak with the students, to hear their hearts, to hear their cries. Um, we agree with you wholeheartedly. We agree with you wholeheartedly. Commissioner Bethel, myself, of course, Dr. Carrera, our mayor, Sherelle Parker, um, as well as our, our new uh, uh, chief public safety officer, Adam Gear. we sat, we heard the cries of the students, we heard the cries of, of the family of the young man whose life was senselessly lost. We know that there is, um, it, we're beyond crisis level. We're beyond a, a place where there's a sense of urgency. Uh, we do know that we must act now. That's why we're really fortunate to have uh, a leader in Kevin Bethel, uh, our commissioner who has both served um, in the police force for many years, but also with the school district. So I'll turn it over to him now. So thank you for that and thank you for your, your question. I mean, I think, Councilman, you know the challenge that we're facing even, you know, started in 2019 when I was the chief of school safety and never thought that I would be dealing with young people being shot in or around a school or let alone being killed in front of a school. Uh, through that process, uh, during my time as chief of school safety, you know, we started to really work hard to build out these safe paths around schools. Uh, I believe there's about 23 schools now that have safe paths that through the data we identified may have the greatest level of challenges, Wagner and other schools around the city uh, to do that. 
uh, with working with the police department, we started to build these safety zones around key schools based on the data that, that told us uh, this would be occurring. Never did we imagine now that we were dealing with the bus carters. I mean, you know, Rising Sun and Cotman would never been a location we would have ever thought that eight children would be shot in, you know, in, 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 in the manner that they were, let alone Ogons Avenue. As a result, you'll see as part of our 100-day plan and we'll be executing even before that plan, is now we're trying now to see how we can put more men and women in those carters where our kids are moving through. Now, we know we talk about, and I know you raised the issue about uh, the charter buses. A lot of our kids don't want to get on the charter bus. For whatever reason it is, they walk right past the charter bus and still, because they like moving through the neighborhood, that's just the cadence of who they are. And so we are working on a strategy now uh, to try to see where we could flood some of the core carters that we see a lot of our kids are, are forming uh, to be able to have an additional presence. But as you know, this is 194 square miles, I believe, the city. It's a lot of, a lot of area to cover. Working with our separate partners, uh, focusing on our hubs uh, our state, as part of the strategy. Uh, but it is going to take an all-hands-on-deck approach now for us uh, until we can get it settled down uh, with this kind of let out or these activities that the, the, the kids are engaging. They do not have any boundaries anymore, uh, which now creates a significant challenge as we try to deploy effectively to make sure we don't have what happened on you know, the week of March the 4th should be something that we all should be looking at and saying, how do we ever have, get to this place where we'd have 11 children shot, one killed, within three days of each other on bu in and around the bus stops. So, but we are putting forth uh, an effort to work in that direction. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, thank you, Council President. I do want to just say, Commissioner, um, you have been an excellent choice. And I know I've said this in other spaces, um, but you are doing an amazing job. Um, thank you for your response to that answer. And I look forward to working with you to be able to address that issue. And as I close out, I just really want to put an exclamation point on the facilities crisis. I believe in my heart that if we do not address this in this year's budget, it will put us in a position where as though we will have nowhere near the capital that we have right now to be able to fix this problem in the near future. So that's my exclamation point, and I'm looking forward to working together to address this crisis. Thank you, Council President. Well, thank you. The chair thank recognizes you. also present Council Member Jeffrey J. Young. The chair recognizes Council Member Anthony Phillips. Thank you, Council President Johnson. I, before I begin with questioning, I just want to say that the, the mayor's budget uh, represents the purest expression of our city's aspirations, of our city's goals and things that our, our neighbors have been asking for a long time. So I want to start by thanking Mayor Parker for rendering all her promises uh, that she made when she made the decision to run for mayor. Yet there are questions that I have that will hopefully help this budget process become a lot more stronger, this, this, this budget proposal a lot more stronger, uh, but most importantly, uh, help the city of, city of Philadelphia uh, understand that we mean business uh, when it comes to the quality of life uh, that they all too desire. So the first question is, uh, former Council President Darrell Clark, my man, <laughs> implemented legislation supported community policing through the introduction of public safety enforcement officers. Uh, these officers would have been tasked with addressing quality of life issues, thereby allowing the police department to focus on other priorities. What is the administration's strategy for recruiting public safety enforcement officers to tackle additional quality of life concerns? Because currently they've only been rolled out in Center City. Are they gonna be rolled out in the district? Is there a plan for the public safety officers? I'd like to call back uh, our police commissioner, Kevin Bethel. As well as, 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 as well as our deputy managing director, Mike Carroll. Good morning. I'm Mike Carroll. I'm the Deputy Managing Director for the Infrastructure, uh, Transportation and Infrastructure Cluster in the Managing Director's Office. Um, so uh, our approach to public safety enforcement officers 
uh, is going to rely heavily on our future track program, which the streets department and uh, now the sanitation department are drawing on in order to help uh, create uh, a pipeline of employees for a variety of roles in the city. Uh, that includes uh, folks who are going on professional tracks uh, in highway maintenance, uh, uh, you know, electrical technicians, folks who are doing uh, seasonal work feed into that. But we're hopeful that we also get people who are interested in taking on this role of enforcement officers supporting the police department uh, in the work that they do and being that constant presence that you're speaking of in the communities. Thank you. Just to, you don't have to follow up now, but um, maybe to email if I can get uh, the line item for this, as well as the what is the rollout plan to get them across all of the districts, and maybe we can help you with the recruitment process. So, and what that will look like. Okay. So thank you. We'll follow up. Right. Council Phillips, uh, we were told my, my team is telling me that. I'm just, as I come on board, I'm not really vested in who, what the work they're doing. I am told that they're working for our abandoned auto and our, and our neighborhood services, the supporters in that work. Clearly, there's an opportunity to use them in a much more expanded role. I'll follow up with you to see exactly what the forecast is for them in that space beyond just working with neighborhood services. Uh, I'll be able to follow up with you with some reporting on that. Thank you. I just have uh, two more questions, Council President. Uh, what role, <coughs> moving on to another question. We're learning about this mayor liaison, mayor liaisons that will serve in every council district. Um, how are you planning to collaborate with city council uh, to cultivate a positive relationship so we can all work together to do the work of the Lord? Because um, district council members, you know, are charged and by neighbors to really push and advocate for needs. And now, you know, is there going to be a conflation? in terms of relationships with now liaison. So it's the idea of there's going to be a level of confusion who to go to. Thank you for that question, Councilman. So the Parker promise is to deliver on government that Philadelphians can see, touch, and feel. Um, and our administration is also committed to ensuring that access to critical re city resources is accessible to everyone, regardless of zip code. So with both of those in mind, um, the neighborhood action centers and the teams that support them uh, just builds upon the critical engagement work that CEO is already doing. So whether it's educating residents on utility resources, um, addressing food scarcity, um, providing resources for uh, um, substance, abu substance abuse and rental assistance. Uh, however, Currently, all of that is all of that critical work being done by CEO is grant is heavily grant dependent, both in the scope and what they can focus on, and the geographic location. So, all the neighborhood action centers do with is make sure that all of those engagement teams are provided for citizens across Philadelphia in every district. Um, I I would like to bring up my colleague Orlando Rendon to who is the new director of CEO, to talk further on this effort and address any other questions in detail. Hmm. Good morning, Orlando Rendon, CEO, executive director. Good morning. So the question, uh, Councilman Phillips, is a good question. It's, um, it's an expansion in terms of what's already going on with the city. We're trying to bring local government to the people's door. Correct. And in doing that, we're go it's not something in a silo. It's working with con conjunction with existing programs within CEO. It would be with working in collaboration with uh, council constituent services. It's, it's a one-stop shop where we are tasked to try to coordinate everything within a particular district, within a particular neighborhood, to make sure that it functions and it works and it's efficient so that everyone gets every resource possible that's available, whether it's city, state, or federal. Yeah, I, I just want to quickly add that I, I think it's a, a noble idea. I, I also think that there should be a way uh, when the rollout plan comes out in every single district, how district council members can work collaboratively with that particular office uh, to ensure not only a success, but to also help people understand that, you know, this is a supportive measure that city council supported with the mayor to make this happen so that we can have more resources on the streets. So I have some ideas around that, so I'd like to you know, set up some time. But most importantly, I just want the district council members to know that 
this is a, you know, it's not a conflation of resources, it's going to be us working together with this particular office. I think that's absolutely how it an enhancement of all engagement wherever it comes from. So, okay, absolutely. good. A lot, two more. That's it. One more. Give me one more. All right, one more question. As the chair, and I will say for the second round, as the chair of children and youth, you know, I, I've, I've been trying to figure out how I want to phrase this question. Um, I've been highly disappointed with the Philadelphia Youth Commission over the years, and I'm thankful that we have a new director. Uh, I say that because the Youth Commission was, an, was a commission that, as a young person, I was part of the steering committee to help start. And what the Youth Commission does, and just so in terms of this particular question in general, just so everyone knows, by Home Rule Charter, there's supposed to be 21 members between the ages of 12 to 23, consists of individuals who understand the needs of young people in the city, the members should represent racial, gender, ethnic, and cultural diversity of the city, and they should, become, they should be recommended by city council members. The structure of the Philadelphia Youth Commission was supposed to have provided recommendations of policies, initiatives that they would send off to their city council members based off of what they've learned in the streets from youth, from community organizations, schools, rec centers, whatever the young people are. Thus far over the past some odd years, even with the potential things I've heard, well, some of the things I've heard that some youth commission directors have said, oh, the, the, the members haven't sent this person, you know, as a representative, we haven't, there's a lack of advocacy and push and structure and oversight over this youth commission to make sure that they're very, very strong. And so I think it's very important that we, if we're gonna have this commission, you know, what are the strategies that we're gonna ensure the success of the commission that we're gonna employ? And does the administration have a plan for its new director to hold a new director accountable and ensure that there's a successful report out? Thank you for that question again. Um, you're preaching to the choir when it comes to engagement, and uh, yeah. that's why we tapped a dynamic young sister named Shania Bennett to lead our youth engagement. Uh, I will say that unfortunately previously we, the, the youth commission hadn't had a full complement of the commissioners, but she has already hit the ground running. We are, we are, we have 19 out of the 21, which is waiting for two more recommendations, um, and we will be at the full complement. But to your point about the youth commission advising on policy and taking that back to the administration, that is absolutely the goal and the the focus for this commission. And we. We, we will empower and plan to empower Shania to be able to take those youth commissioners' recommendations back to the administration. We plan on, have on having a qualitative and quantitative approach to all of our engagement, whether it's Latino, youth, black male engagement, so that we are taking government to the people, um, both in the community engagement and in the constituency engagement, and we absolutely intend to, to listen to our young people and bring, have that constant feedback loop so that our policies are informed by what we hear from them. So your, your comments are taken in 100% in agreement. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Um, the Chair recognizes Council Member Catherine Gilmore Richardson, and just for the record, just want to know, can everyone speak into the microphone? Because a lot of mem individuals who are here can't hear you, so please speak into the microphone. Councilman Kathy Gilmore Richardson. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you all very much uh, for your testimony. Uh, Council President, you already reviewed one of my questions uh, regarding the overall financial outlook for the city, but I wanted to get a few things on the record based on the proposed budget that we have to sort of help us in understanding uh, as we uh, undertake this process, uh, and particularly also as a member uh, and vice chair of the Appropriations Committee. Uh, you talked about uh, in your testimony uh, about the financial challenges that we know the city is facing, including the end of the um, ARPA funds, also the lower than anticipated revenue uh, for both wage and uh, real estate transfer taxes, um, sort of the high legacy and fixed costs. You know that balloon payment is also forthcoming. Uh, but also some of the significant service demands that we have relative to the type of population demographics that we have here in the city. And so I wanted to just more fully understand how the administration is thinking more holistically uh, about the fund balance, about the budget stabilization reserve, um, about the recession reserve and some of the other savings um, to ensure that we have the resources necessary uh, in case of economic downturn. And I say that 
uh, Rob, and I know we'll have uh, the city treasurer's office coming soon, but I think right now we have sort of an inversion of the treasury yield curve right now uh, relative to short-term savings. Uh, but if you could just for me uh, quickly review, and I did some scratch math, but I just want to confirm. Uh, fund balance for FY25, FY26, FY27, FY28, and then FY29. Yep, just take me one second to get there. And then I'll... Okay, excellent. I kind of thought this question was coming. So. Yes, of course. <laughs> okay, so for FY25, um, we are uh, budgeted a, a fund balance of 486 million. Okay. Uh, for FY26, and FY25 is the last year of the American Rescue Plan money. Right. So right. we always thought that our fund balance would go down after that went away. Um, and it does, in FY26, it goes down to 247 million. Okay. Uh, in FY27, it's uh, 55 million. Okay. In FY28, it's 24 million. Okay. And then in FY29, it's 14.6 million. Okay. Do you want me to go through the budget stipulation reserve fund next? Excellent. And, and I think really, for the record, if we could just go over what the BSR contributions would have been based on the FY24 budget that we just passed, and then if you could then detail for the record the projections for the BSR contributions for the current proposed FY25, because I'm really just trying to understand yeah. the difference. So I, I don't have the year by year in front of me, but I know okay. that over the five years, the amount in the fund is about 22 million lower okay. than it would than the contributions from last year's plan. Okay, and then do you think it's any difference in making a contribution to the inflation reserve versus the BSR? Does it matter? Yes, um, because um, the BSRF has a different standard for taking money out. Right. Right. So that that money is kind of is set aside more firmly for a rainy day. I mean, it's really a rainy day fund. Right, right. So IR, you would say, has more flexibility relative to our ability to draw down from the IR versus the BSR because it would have to be certain uh, financial outlook in order for us to go into BSR, correct? Correct. Okay. And I also, just give me one moment. Oh. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, thank you for that, Rob. Uh, I wanted to also talk about diversity in, in contracting because I know that's something uh, that Mayor Parker has really put a strong emphasis on around uh, growing uh, MBE, WBE, and DBE businesses. And so I just wanted to understand what the administration's uh, overall strategy is um, to sort of increase the amount of contracting dollars we're spending on minority firms. And as an aside, I just wanted to add, I'm holding the balance of my questions relative to um, additional savings that we could achieve for the treasurer's office uh, later on in the week, because I know that we have some refunding and other things that may be on the horizon that could help us achieve additional savings. And they'll be here tomorrow. Right, right, okay. Thank you so much, council member. So I'd like to actually call up our uh, new commerce director, Alba Martinez, that can answer the questions around our priorities with regards to MBEs. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Councilwoman, I believe that um, we shouldn't be satisfied with where we are. I'll start there. Second of all, when we compare city government contracting diversity to private sector, we're ahead of the game. So there's something to be learned about how we're doing things, and there's more that we need to do. So with that in mind, uh, we have a registry that has over 2,000 diverse uh, companies on it. We need to grow that registry. And that we're going to use the power of street outreach, marketing, communication, you know, aim our partnerships and our relationships in this space to truly look for that outcome. And we, we are set up for success to do that if we all pull the cart in, in, in one direction. In, in addition to that, um, there's, there's this uh, opportunity that we have working with the Office of Minority uh, Business Success and my colleague, uh, Rachel Branson, I call her Cousin Rachel, because the reality is that uh, Commerce and, and, and Director Branson are going to work hand in hand 
to take where we are to the next level. Because if we don't do it now, when are we gonna do it? So what you have from us is a commitment to use the tools we have and take them to the next level. And I do believe that connecting with people uh, to, to apply, make it easy for them to apply uh, for this certification and others, right, private sector certification as well, um, and, and for us to guide them through that process is essential. Excellent, and so uh, if you could speak specifically to black-owned businesses here in the city of Philadelphia, because historically that's been one of the, the lower um, percentage groups relative to both city contracting and other contract opportunities. Uh, if you could talk about how you all plan to expand outreach to particularly black-owned businesses uh, and also assist them with certification and technical assistance, uh, again, particularly because we know that there is some uh, anticipated borrowing that will take place relative to some capital needs for projects. I'll give an example for water as an example. I think they have a, a anticipated 500 million. I was just reading in some of the documents. And so if you could talk about specifically how we're teeing businesses up to be able to compete for those opportunities, because most often we hear um, that they may not have set requirements or, you know, they're missing, you know, two or three things to be able to uh, apply for the contract because the work may be so specialized. So how are we working from a technical assistance uh, perspective to help individuals to be ready for those forthcoming opportunities? because outside of a rebuild, as an example, we have some larger uh, city contracting opportunities that are coming up, or, or quasi-city-related uh, agencies. So, so I can't go to the detail of talking about numbers, but I can talk about strategy and sort of what I see as the opportunity, and happy to follow up you know, with, with any further detail. Um, but I will, I will talk about it in terms of tuning and scaling. Right, so I, I have found, and I'm very proud of this, that the Philadelphia Commerce Department has the components in place to achieve success. I really, truly believe that. Uh, but they're not always at scale where they need to be, and they're not always necessarily um, fine-tuned to get to what we want. So number one, um, the mayor, and I, I really should defer to Rachel to speak to this, you know, but the mayor has a vision uh, around which, which I share, which is about a minority business accelerator, like to create some sort of concentrated program. I'm not sure that it's an incubator or that level of intensity. Mm -hmm. But in addition to that, even without that, we already have a number of pieces in place. We have relationships with tremendous uh, community development organizations in the neighborhoods uh, that where predominantly our black residents live and therefore our black uh, businesses are. And uh, we need to do more targeted outreach through those organizations and to those communities in a way that tells them we want you to belong to this journey. So that's one piece of it, the outreach. And the other is that um, we need to uh, tune the technical assistance to where the problems are. For example, a lot of businesses, black, brown, you know, just minority, economically disadvantaged, struggle with back-end processes. You know, they may fall down on their accounting because they're too busy, you know, cleaning the floor. And so we need to think about how we can scale that kind of support for businesses, either do it for them or pay somebody to, you know, create a back end office, a new business like that, or to get them to a level where they are, you know, self-sufficient. There are multiple strategies, but more work really needs to be done to be able to scale that in Philadelphia. And that's just the honest truth. But, but the pieces are there and the intention is there, and that's really important. Right, and as you were speaking, I was thinking of the program that I know uh, the mayor supported when she was here in council, the Goldman Sachs program at uh, CCP. Uh, and so I was thinking specifically about programs of that nature. Uh, quickly, uh, while I still have a little time in this round, uh, I wanted to talk about also workforce development under the Commerce Department. Um, that was an issue that was exceedingly important to me. Um, I don't know that um, you're aware of relative to, from an institutional knowledge perspective because you weren't here. Um, that under the Kenny administration during COVID, initially um, that department was slated to um, be eliminated 
uh, as a part of government, and we fought through this council body to have a workforce development unit uh, in commerce, and then obviously the legislation that former council president Clark uh, did around uh, having a workforce development reporting uh, structure with your department. And so uh, I, for one, appreciate working with the workforce development team, and I hear the bell. Uh, in the Commerce Department. I do love the work that they do. We work together very closely. I just wanted you all to talk about um, what you sort of look and uh, what you look forward to and think about uh, as far as their role um, from a workforce development perspective directly in commerce and in government while also working with Philadelphia Works. Thank you, Mr. President. You're welcome. So, so um, Workforce is the other side of the coin of business success, right? A business is not going to succeed without workforce. So uh, commerce cannot uh, disconnect itself or, or, or not be integrated in the thinking about how do we address our talent pipeline challenges if we want to grow the economy through the growth of businesses of all kinds. So um, I believe that an important part of what we need to do with our workforce unit is to be strategic about where we create value. Like there's no reason for us to be competing with other programs. So when we're going to invest programs like the mayor is proposing in her budget, we should be doing innovative things. For example, um, she talks about job training programs that have guaranteed job outcomes. Not every training program that we're funding is, is doing that. Pardon the other the thing is that programs that we fund Pardon through this. the interruption. I apologize because I heard the bell, but. Oh, I apologize. Um, are you talking about class 200 investments from your department, meaning you would be funding another program, or would it be coordination from in the department? Um, okay, to clarify, and I'll be very brief, the team leads the strategy, right? Mm -hmm. so, so what I'm really referring to is that our team needs to add value in terms of how, where we innovate, where we can show more efficient paths to close the talent gaps. And, and that could include, but doesn't always have to include, spending money on innovative programs. Okay. It could also include coordination. And an initiative we have underway, which I'd love to uh, talk about in the future, is what we call uh, the Workforce Efficient Market Strategy, which, we, which would allow us to close gaps by understanding supply and, de and demand in a way that we have never understood before. And with that, I'll yield time. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Martinez, um, and I know there's a significant investment around a variety of different areas in terms of improving um, services to the city of Philadelphia, whether that's public safety, whether that's clean and green, and there's a request for significant investment, but just following up on what Council Member um, Gilmar Richardson has worked on in terms of workforce development, we have a significant amount of vacancies. Right. So what is that strategy, right, to hire up? Because this is a significant ask, right? But will we have the manpower to actually accomplish the things that we want to accomplish based upon the level of vacancies that we have right now? So we're going to scale up, but it seems like also we don't have the manpower. And then the last part, you talked about this new office around minority, black businesses, which is great, but also you didn't work in a partnership with the Commerce Department, but I, you didn't talk about the Office of Equal Opportunity that specifically focuses on making sure we're strategizing to make sure black and brown and other minority businesses have a seat at the table and we're reaching their goals. Yeah, and I should have mentioned the registry and the outreach is, is right, it's, it's the Office of Economic uh, opportunity. So I apologize for not mentioning that. That's, that's definitely the department in the city that takes the lead around our registry and our outreach. And, and when I talk about expanding that registry, that's who I'm talking about. In addition to, you know, doing the contract compliance and monitoring. But do y'all meet like regularly, like part of your, your yes. brain trust? Because from DI, like it's really no DI without that particular department. Yeah, hundred percent. Yes. Yes. So it's, 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 it is integrated and it has to be a highly integrated strategy. All right, and just want to put a pin in one last note. A lot of times we hear the narrative that businesses need their back office support, but I, I meet a lot of businesses that say, we don't need a program, we need an opportunity, right? To go from being prime, I mean, to go from being subs to primes, right? Because in the city of Philadelphia, the same old businesses day in and day out still get the contracts and then they'll come get the minorities to be the people that come meet with us 
to get the sign on. And so we're trying to change that narrative to focus more on black and brown businesses being more prime as opposed to the subs to kind of diversify. And I'm quite sure, um, and I know our mayor has an agenda of not doing business as usual um, under this administration. So this is something to take in consideration in terms of um, our agenda. Hence, we have the Special Committee on Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion to examine what we're doing on the city, as well as on the private side, because we all know DI is right now being attacked across the country, which is basically an attack on primarily black and brown folks and women-owned businesses as well. So. Thank you, 100% agree. So the, the big focus for, for our Minority Business Success Office is to ensure that not only are we focusing on the back end, to your point, Council President, uh, but to ensure that it's a one front door uh, model. To the question around uh, workforce development, we understand and have kind of tracked the Office of, of Workforce Development over the last few years, um, where it sits now, of course, in the Commerce Department. Um, there is definitely an external approach, a, a focus, but also an internal focus. Through our new chief uh, administrative officer, um, Camille Duchesse, who's working very closely with Mike Zakagny in our Office of Human Resources. We're looking at our workforce, new skills initiatives to ensure that we take a comprehensive approach, not just around uh, uh, decreasing uh, the vacancy rate, but to ensuring that, uh, that the people that we put in those roles, they have a pathway to, to progression in those roles, not just entry level, but, but throughout, throughout the course of their career. Good, thank you. The chair recognizes Council Member Kendra Brooks. Oh, okay, thank you. I want to thank the members of the administration for your overview of the five-year plan, and I appreciate the presentation we received, and I'm optimistic to see many shared priorities in this budget. However, I want to focus my questions this morning around one of the biggest proposed new investments, um, and similar to some of the questions that Council President asked about the wellness and triage centers. Um, there has been a lot of discussion about Philadelphia's addiction crisis, harm reduction, and what the purpose of these proposed centers are over the last few weeks. And I know people throughout my community are concerned about some of the rhetoric surrounding these centers, and I share their concerns. Um, because of that, I'm hoping to understand the administration's vision around these centers. Um, over the last four years, my office have led efforts to make sure that Philadelphia is leading in a response to this public health crisis against addiction. Um, and that's with empathy and the best recommended public health responses um, in tackling this national problem. Um, this work includes leading the delegation of my colleagues to tour overdose prevention sites in New York City last year. Um, and what we saw at the overdose prevention site was a wide spectrum of harm reduction tactics, including education efforts, healthcare support, and resources for those struggling with substance use disorders. Um, and we should understand that safe consumption practices are not the only thing that these overdose prevention sites provide to those struggling with addictions. Um, and there has been little discussion about what services will be offered at this wellness and triage centers. And I was just wondering, can you describe a little bit more? I know in council president's question, um, he talked about, uh, you're planning to build out the system. Um, and the triage centers is depending on funding and seed money. And I was very, I'm just trying to figure out funding, seed money, where every council district focus in Kensington. I would like a clearer picture of what that looks like. And it's coming from the point, I have nine members in my neighbor, nine senior members in my neighborhood have overdosed in the last month. Nine, and even coming in this morning, I'm getting phone calls from neighbors um, concerned about retaliation in my community over overdose of their loved ones. I just need to know and understand what does wellness and triage look like in every community in the city, not just where I live, but other communities that are not the primary focus of the Kensington plan. Council Member Adam Teal again, Managing Director. Uh, really appreciate your, your question and your comments. Certainly the challenges that we have with addiction and substance use disorder exist not just in Kensington, uh, all around the city. As we see the data, we see that scourge continuing to creep around the city. We know that uh, Kensington has been particularly hard hit and there's a lot of investment there. 
there are a lot of folks doing great work there. And we expect everybody who's doing that life-saving work, including multiple city agencies with multiple programs, to continue doing that important work. What we are doing as an administration uh, with uh, Mayor Parker's really bold vision is prioritizing and reprioritizing our limited dollars to ensure that we are building out the rest of the continuum of care from a lot of focus on short-term, life-saving, and harm reduction, both of which are absolutely important, and we expect that work to continue. We want to ensure that we are, because it, it looks like, you know, this is an area where the city really needs to take the lead. And Mayor Parker has stepped up with this bold vision for the city to lead and convene and develop the rest of this continuum of care, which starts with triage and bringing people in, making sure they have the services that they need, and then moving them through to medium-term help, care, treatment, and long-term housing and economic opportunity. What exactly does that look like? That is, you know, that is under development. You know, we are looking at uh, where we can do this. We are looking at how we can do this. We actually had a meeting. Uh, our uh, wonderful Deputy Managing Director for Health and Human Services, Crystal Yates Gale, who absolutely uh, has helped build and operate programs in the city to help address these challenges. Uh, we met with a number of the great uh, harm reduction providers that are out there today doing this work and invited them to be part of the process of designing exactly how this is going to work. We want to make sure that we have the perspective and the lens of folks with lived experience for how they're going to move through this system. It won't be effective otherwise. So we really want to make sure that we're going to do this right. We met with them. We invited them. We're going to meet with them again. And we also want to make sure that the needs of our communities are centered in this work. So we also want to make sure that we're meeting with the communities and talking with them about how we can ensure that these capabilities, this capacity is built out in a way that is respectful of the community and the people who live in those communities and recognizing that our challenges with this kind of work exist all across the city. We think the solutions uh, probably also are going to need to be distributed. The specifics of that are under development and certainly the amount of capacity that we have is going to depend on the dollars that we're able to bring to this, to this part of the mission and building this out. So we want to make sure that we are including folks in that work, which is one reason why you know, I don't want to sit here and tell you what, what I would do because we want to make sure that the folks, uh, our community, folks who live in these communities, live, work, and play in our communities, and the folks who are closest to this life-saving work are part of that build-out. Oh, so I thank you for that. And I just want to kind of emphasize that in my zip code, area of overdoses in the city. Um, and this process is very important when we, how we're going to find, secure um, a site for these proposed locations. And to Council Member Isaiah's point about education, how can we fund something if there's no plan around it? And I understand it takes time to meet up with the numerous groups around this issue, and I do applaud the work around it. And I also want to applaud the work of the city agencies that were able to step out and do our emergency rapid response in my neighborhood around the first seven of these overdoses that were happening um, in my immediate um, area. My part two question is about um, the, just the reality that the public, the public health science is clear and we realize that forced treatment doesn't work. And I believe that our city's policies should reflect that and that's why I'm a strong supporter of harm reduction policies. Um, the public health science is clear on this. People forced into treatment have higher rates of relapses and overdose. And I wonder, like, will these triage centers take into consideration public health science? And what is the plan for those who do not successfully, successfully complete treatment? And I want to say, you know, in their first attempt. And I want to say, like, of these nine people that I'm speaking of, these are people that I know firsthand, community members, long-time addiction, I'm not talking about like the folks that many of us know that cut your grass, the folks that you can pay that clean up your block, some of the folks that are part of the same day pay, pay program, 
these are the folks that I'm talking about. We're not just talking about just pure homeless folks. We're talking about community members that just so happen to have addictions. And I just want to make sure that we're very intentional about not singling out or making this crisis uh, compartmentalized in the reality that we all know folks that are struggling with addictions in every neighborhood, in every community that are functional members of our community. And I just want to make sure that we're considering the public health science in relation to this as we set up these treatment centers. And some of these folks have been in and out of recovery their entire lives. So I just would, I'm, you know, I'm just trying to get clear, clarity, like what does happen if, you know, complete treatment on your first attempt does not work? Are you just passed out the system forever? Or are there opportunities for people to engage at different levels? Councilmember, I think uh, you've really exactly articulated the need for this, for achieving this vision and making sure that folks have access to the types of care that they need that is absolutely informed by the science. So we are meeting at the same time that we are meeting with folks who have lived experience to help them with the design. Uh, we are meeting with members of the community and we'll be doing more of that and, and outreach to ensure that we are meeting the community's needs. We are also meeting with the folks who are the experts. You heard me talk before about Mayor Parker's convening with uh, providers and healthcare systems and insurers. There are, as you know, uh, this is a very complicated, I would say even complex, I'm not even sure I would use the word system because we do have uh, too many silos. There are too many folks who, as they progress, they, they can't get their particular needs met. You know, I, I'm an emergency medical technician, a paramedic by trade and by training. So I know that when in doubt, listen to the patient. And we know that people have, for all of us who've been patients ever in our lives, we know that people have different needs. They need different types of treatment. And what we think is needed is exactly what you're talking about, is a, a big vision and a series of investments that are going to allow us to do exactly what you're suggesting, which is to make sure that we are getting the right treatment for the right folks at the right time for the amount of time that they need to be able to move forward, take access, or have, take advantage of the access to economic opportunity uh, and really have what they need. So we, we agree that there are a lot of gaps and, and that is the point of this, uh, this very bold vision of Mayor Parker's is to ensure that we have a way to address uh, everybody and give them what they need for the amount of time that they need. And another follow-up, you know, the highest rate of overdose in Philadelphia is black men aged 45 to 65. The people who are most negatively also impacted by the war on drugs. And we can't afford to return to these failed policies. So I have a question about what role does law enforcement play in these in, imposed, proposed, I'm sorry, triage centers as we move forward? Council member, I guess I would ask uh, uh, Commissioner Bethel and, and to, to start with that and maybe uh, uh, my other colleague, our Chief Public Safety Director, Adam Gear, to, to contribute to that. We are, rest assured, we are all working in sync. So, Councilman, thank you for your... Oh, hey, how are you? <laughs> I mean, we, we see it as a, as a significant opportunity for us. I mean, far too long, I mean, we understand the enforcement, we understand where the arrest plays in this process, but all too often we've not had a place where we've taken someone, so we oftentimes make an arrest, they go through withdrawals, and we take them to the hospital, and that's how it ends, right? And so uh, what the Madden Director describes and what the mayor has put forth is an opportunity for us now to treat the whole person right, and be able to, so our part will be, even in our work as we go into Kensington and other areas, is always offer treatment as part of that work, you know, and giving opportunities for us, you know, in our police aided diversion now, we divert a number of people without taking them into custody. Many of those individuals we will turn over and hope that they go to services, but oftentimes not be able to complete that loop. And so I think for us as a law enforcement agency, it gives us an opportunity now to really have something 
to be able to say, if I have an individual here today who wants to go to treatment, I don't have to parse around. I can be able to take this person to some a place where they can get all the needs that they the, to service them. And so we see it as a, a great addition to our work and really build upon the work that we want to do as an organization. You know, so I, I, I hear that. So we realize also that study after study has shown that stabilizing people in housing is a way, um, a key way to decrease in drug use. So um, we know that sweeps have been tried many times in Philadelphia and around the country, and they do not address the root causes of the issue. What is being done in this budget to create stable and accessible housing to all Philadelphians and those who are suffering with addiction? Council member, thank you. Part of the, the process for the triage centers, and we've heard our managing director say this a number of times, is, is includes housing. But we're also focused on creating new housing, stabilizing housing, and that may be apartments, that may be home ownership. When we're talking about low-income people, we are working with PHA, we are working with CDCs, we're working to ensure that they all have the resources that they need so that housing for people who need it is available, and that's across every socioeconomic strata. I, I hear you, but I understand the system at the same time and housing is not readily available, if we pick somebody up right here on Dillsworth Plaza, we can't put them in housing right away, depending on your family size and your work and your conditions. So I just have a strong concern if we cannot stabilize housing while people are going through outpatient treatment or whatever, what, what system is in place within this budget to secure this? And you're saying new housing, are we doing uh, rapid rehousing for folks going through addiction? Are we setting up new places? to offer two years of employment for someone that's going through that with work, workforce development attached to it, and if that doesn't work, what happens? So I, I hear, I see the big vision. The devil is in the details, and I just, you know, I, I've been studying this since I've been in council. So I, I know I'm going down the rabbit hole, but the, I've been down the rabbit hole, whether it was at the encampment on the parkway, the one on Ridge Avenue, folks that come to our office every day and my questions are centered in the real stories that my constituent services staff impact, I mean, reach every day. So, you know, I just, just help me understand because part of funding this big vision is understanding the plan. And I, I, I'm a visionary, I get it. But before I get, we sign off the dollars, it has to be a plan. And I have to realize that these services that I know that are gaps in, silo that you guys said are in place and will work as we move forward. Council member, what you're saying that you know, the, these supports, this system doesn't exist, we agree, which is exactly why we are gonna try to address all of the things that you're talking about. And that's the work that's happening now as we're convening and meeting. Uh, would certainly love to meet and talk with you more about it. We agree that you know, and just in meeting with some of these folks who are out there every day, they're talking about, you know, if we can just get folks to a phone, sometimes that might be enough. Let them get a call. Let them get a shower. Let them use a toilet. Uh, that's a first step. You know, we hear from our providers who are out there that sometimes, you know, every day, day in and day out, we have folks who are out there and they're saving lives and they see the same people coming back and coming back and coming back. And then one day, Every now and then, someone will come up and knock on the window and say, I'm ready. I'm ready. And we need to make sure that we can get them not just to an initial facility that has the skills to take care of them on that day, but to help them move from that day, that short-term care, into medium and longer-term treatment, housing, an economic opportunity and we agree a hundred percent that does not exist right now in a, a connected and joined up way which is why we are that's what we're building and we think as as much as a hundred million dollars sounds like it's a lot and it is this is a bold investment it is I think you just said it, it it's a drop in the bucket for what we need it's a start it's a big start it's letting us have conversations that we could not have had before 
and we certainly hope that you will, will sign on to this vision and help us execute with Mayor Parker's leadership. I mean, this is not small ball. This is a big deal. Nobody's doing this. We think this is an opportunity for our city, one city, united city, to address this and build out something that nobody's ever seen before, and we look forward to continuing to work with you in that work. All right, I have another round of questions. But I'll in your next that. round, okay. all right, we want to make sure we get to all the members so we can get down to the next round. But Mr. Thiel, just, just real brief, because the young lady pointed out some key points. What's the time frame for this plan? Because, I mean, you want the money up front. What's the time frame that we can expect a return on the investment? Uh, Council President, you don't mean to tell you that uh, time is money. Uh, time is life. So the more investment that we're able to have and the more we're able to know, the faster this will go. We are looking to be able to have our first triage center uh, available in a matter of weeks. That is an extremely aggressive where? target and timeline. Do you uh, know where? At the Council President, I mean, I, the honest answer to that question is no, because we are doing due diligence on a number of potential sites, working with a number of different partners. We're still talking with, because it is so important to make sure that the clinical part of this is aligned with the science and aligned with the providers. So, I mean, I honestly can't answer that question because you know, it depends on a variety of factors and it certainly depends on us being able to know, uh, and we appreciate all the different priorities that council has, uh, that council is aligned with our mayor for this very bold vision that we're looking to execute and implement in a way, in partnership, that nobody's ever seen. Okay. I don't think it's that if we are or aren't, I think folks just have questions and the devil is always in the details. And so yes, I think sir, we're on understood. the same page. Councilman Jamie Gaudier. Thank you, Council President, um, and good morning, everybody. Um, my questions are about uh, planning and development and housing. Um, so compared to FY24, the proposed FY25 budget cuts 60% uh, of the Department of Planning and Development's um, budget. Um, this is the um, agency that houses um, the majority of the city's planning and affordable housing resources. Um, this cut includes a $17 million reduction in services. Um, can you elaborate on why you're cutting DPD's budget so substantially and which programs will be impacted um, by this proposed cut? Council Member, first, thank you for your question, and uh, you and I have sat down, and I know that you're a true leader on this issue. Um, I'm going to ask Martine I'm not sure where she is, to uh, come up and represent the, Depart the Department of Planning and Development on the answer to this, but know that, that the mayor, and we've discussed this, is, is truly committed to housing. It is one of the key tenants of her plan, 30,000 homes for homeowners in her first term. So know that we're working diligently on that. But the specific budget cuts, I'm going to look to Martine to answer. Oh. Hi. Um, so this isn't my full area of expertise, but I'll do my best. Um, we do struggle with reduced funding from the federal government on a regular basis. So we, we uh, are trying to be as creative as we possibly can. And um, you know, we have a dedicated staff of housing professionals who look for every single opportunity possible. Um, we we're, we're try to be as creative as possible through zoning code bonuses uh, for affordable housing. Uh, we, you know, we try to reduce the barriers as much as possible while finding as many possible venues for funding as we possibly can. So I think we need everyone's support in this um, and we will continue to uh, work with city council offices on figuring out how we can make this happen. What do the cuts um, represent and which programs would be uh, impacted? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so specifically the cut was, um, I, you know, I might need to ask Rob and Tavari for help, but I believe that the cut was in the rental assistance program. So that was a temporary allocation to uh, housing that um, has run out. Is, is that correct, Rob? Sorry. That's right. Oh, it is right? Okay. Yep. Yes, during the 
and a tail end of the pandemic, um, we did a two-year allocation of 15 million a year to rental assistance in the general fund to supplement the 15 million a year that's in the housing trust fund. So those two years were up, so the 15 million is not in the 25 budget. It was never anticipated to continue, um, but the 15 million is still in the housing trust fund. So there's still money for rental assistance, it just doesn't show in the general fund. Okay, I just wanna make sure that I understand. The cut to DPD was for rental assistance? So there was two years, we had, we had committed to do two years of rental assistance in the general fund to supplement what's in the housing trust fund. Those two years are 23 and 24. So we had the money in 23 and 24, and then as had always been planned, it was not continued into 25. Were we, um, so uh, can you sort of make a comparison as to how much rental assistance we were providing in past years with this budgeted amount and how, as compared to how much we would be yes, proposing can, this year? We can get you that, yes. We'll get back to you with that. Do you have a, is this, does this represent a cut in your, uh, to your knowledge? Yes, it's, it's, well, it's not really a cut because this is kind of, it was a two-year program and that two-year program's up. So this is what was always anticipated. Okay, um, were we providing more than 15 million in rental assistance in past years given the, DPD budget allocation and the amount in the housing trust yes, fund? Yes, there was a housing trust fund amount and the general fund amount. About how much were we providing in past years? 15 million each. So we were providing about 30 million? Correct. Okay, by my account, um, about you know half of renters in my district, over half, 54%, um, are cost burdened. Um, that translates to a gap of 75 million um, in terms of uh, the housing costs that people can't afford um, on a monthly basis um, citywide. Do we think that there's less of a need for rental assistance now? Uh, so, let's go back to this was a two-year program and that's what it was funded for. Okay, but we've, I mean, this is a bold budget. Um, I agree with you. The vision is very bold. So we are taking steps to um, propose, you know, pretty dramatic increases in things that we um, believe in, that I believe in, um, like clean and green. Do we also share a bold vision around helping renters to stay in their homes? Yeah, and there are, I mean, as Aaron said, there are lots of, programs in this budget that help with home ownership and with renters. Um, I don't know whether any of those you want to talk through. Yeah, I, as a council member, um, part of NPI touches on shallow rental assistance. We have, uh, we're looking at housing subsidy through, for renters, building new, using tools like the land bank to help lower the cost for renters. Um, for lower income renters that qualify for vouchers um, using federal programs through HUD. So there's a, there is a patchwork here to get there with, even though there is not gonna be the continuation of the direct rental assistance program at the same level. Okay, do we know, are you aware that when we were providing, you know, when we were kind of flush with rental assistance money, we were able to offset, um, you know, evictions by 90%. Um, the eviction diversion program, which has been nationally acclaimed, um, took Philadelphia from the fourth highest evict evicting city in the country um, to, you know, being able to offset evictions and keep thousands of people in their homes. That program works best with rental assistance. When we had the rental assistance, we were able to, um, you know, push away 90% of those evictions and keep people in their homes. Um, I think that's a worthwhile investment and a great return on investment. What do you think about the success of that program and the critical need for rental assistance? And do you think that this budget um, meets, you know, the need within our neighborhoods? Yeah, th thank you, Council Member. It, it does it a little differently, that's for sure. Um, we're continuing to look at, we're continuing to analyze uh, 
one of the things that you've heard both of my colleagues talk about is really truly a data-based approach. Um, we're, we're doing what we can with the finite resources that we have available, and we're going to continue to look at this, see how the programs play out, and if there's need to reassess, we have the analytics in place to take a look at this. Okay, I would encourage that. We are, you know, some of these programs approach our wildest dreams. You know, a trash crew in each district is like, you know, pretty amazing, right? We can, you know, you're asking for a big number as it relates to the triage center, and, and even though council is asking for more detail on that, we can think big about successful programs, right? These aren't um, programs that are unproven. Um, these are programs that we have a lot of data on, um, and we also have a lot of data on um, the actual need. Um, so I would, you know, strongly push back against cutting down um, such a critical resource. Even the 30 million doesn't reach the amount uh, of the rental gap that we have in the city in one month, right? Um, I wanted to ask about eviction diversion specifically. Um, you know, this has been a wildly successful program. Um, it's protected, you know, thousands of tenants and kept them um, in their homes and helped us as a city because it helps us not to have people on the street um, and homeless. Um, can you talk about the specific amount that, you know, this budget includes for eviction diversion? You know, I'll defer to Rob on the specific amount, but there is an increase in the five-year plan for each year between 24 and 29 for both scaling and funding, as for both scaling the funding and reduction of NPI funding. Um, this is also uh, the, uh, I'm sorry, the reduction in NPI is due to eviction diversion needing to draw down NPI funds as community development block grant CV window winds down. So the Philadelphia eviction program, the right to counsel, is going to be increased um, incrementally over the five years, and I'll look to Rob if yeah, you have I that available now. I think the amount in 25 is nine million. Okay, for eviction diversion and um, right to counsel. Yes. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Would you be able to provide? We were having a little bit of trouble identifying that detail. Can Can you provide detail to counsel with a breakdown of all of uh, the proposed um, costs for? rental uh, programs, including diversion, PEP, um, and right to counsel, and anything else that you all are including um, in the budget. Will do. Thank you. Um, I also just wanted to get clarity on um, whether there's any expansion of the PHL Housing Plus program. This is a guaranteed income pilot um, that we've been doing to help people on the Section 8 voucher um, waiting list. It's been um, incredibly um, successful in terms of helping tenants in the city. What are the plans around um, keeping this program going, especially knowing that, you know, we're still in a situation where people are 10 years away from getting housing vouchers that they, that they really need um, to supplement their income uh, and to get affordable housing. Yeah, uh, council member, I, I know there's a number of programs that are being talked about. I'd have to look into that specifically and get back to you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, thank you, council president. Thank, thank you. Just provide, make sure you provide the information regarding rental aversion to all members of council, including the chair of um, housing. Thank you very much. The chair recognizes Councilman Curtis Jones. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. And um, welcome to some and welcome back to others. Uh, some of you are gluttons for punishment, but we're... <laughs> We're glad to have I you back. I don't know who you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> um, Boulder Vision. Um, I uh, first want to start with, if I understand the numbers correctly, we're at 6.3 billion, Correct. would it yes. be? And if I compare that to the Kenny administration, they were 6.4 which yes. is, and I didn't go to Girls High, <laughs> but that's a 2% reduction for this bold vision. Am I right? So let me give you some context. I understand oh, the question. Context. 
So um, one of the things that we're proposing to do in 24 is move forward some of the investments um, that are crucial to achieving our goals. So for example, clean and green, um, there's a need for material supplies equipment. So we've asked for you know, over 35 million of money that would typically be spent in 35 or in, in 25 or later to be moved up to 24. So we can start these programs right away. Same thing with paving. There's about 50 million of paving. Normally it would be waiting. We're trying to move that and forward. And for district council people, that represents like double the amount of paving we're able to do? That's, that's the goal, yes. Um, and another example is the forensic lab. That was in 25, we're trying to move that forward too. So the reason you're seeing a dip from 24 to 25 is those programs that we're proposing to move forward. So with an inflationary rate annually of 3.14, I think it is, that ain't bad. But yeah, inflation has gone that, that, that okay. area. So I wanna shift my questions to cleaner, greener, safer with economic opportunity for all. I got excited at the budget address um, on the cleaner side when we start talking about conversion of lots from dangerous places to safe spaces. I'd like to know about that. On the um, greener, um, no, cleaner, let's go with that. Two pickups a week of trash and how we're gonna roll that out, because I like that. Um, and if, if I could end up with 400 police officers on the street, that's safer for me. With economic opportunity for all, let's go with your municipal high school. I need to know about those things. I'm excited about them. And as I look at you know, what you're proposing as a budget, how you're squeezing all of this into that. So. Feel free to take one in, cleaner, greener, safer, with economic opportunity for all. Sure, so I'll start with cleaner. Uh, I'd like to call up our new uh, cabinet director of Clean and Green, uh, Carlton Williams, who is uh, no stranger to you all. Uh, and um, thank you for coming so quickly. I, I was gonna say, <laughs> thought I had a few minutes, <laughs> or a few seconds at least, but I was going to say um, yeah, thank you so much um, for for your for your remarks and uh, our new director is going to talk about how we're going to shift the narrative away from Philadelphia Philadelphia to a clean and green city. Good morning, thank you, and good morning, council members, council president, and honorable members of city council. My name is Carlton Williams, and I'm the director of clean and green initiatives for the city of Philadelphia. Uh, we are very excited, as you stated, um, about being uh, bold about addressing the issues of litter and illegal dumping, um, but we're looking at it at a holistic strategy, um, not just, we talked about silos and working um, in different parts of the departments. Our plan addresses multiple issues in a community all at one time because it doesn't make sense for us to clean the streets and leave the lots, as you stated, unaddressed. It doesn't make sense to leave abandoned autos in areas where we've cleaned around with mechanical street sweeping. So we're working across departmental lines. Our new approach is to work holistically um, and proactively not waiting for things to happen, but going out to find things, and how we're doing this in a number of ways. A, we're establishing a community appearance index. We've used the litter index before to measure uh, how effective things are in a community or neighborhood. We're now taking that strategy and applying it across multiple quality of life issues. Not only are we looking at litter and illegal dumping, we're looking at abandoned autos, graffiti, we're looking at vacant lots and nuisance businesses because these are the things that tear away at the fabric of our communities. Uh, we're also looking at how we manage our trash collection. You talked about twice a week. Most of the illegal dumping or a good percentage of it is not just C and D materials, which is construction and demolition, it's residential household trash. Many people, um, don't have the capacity, especially in densely populated communities, to store trash. Unfortunately, they take matters into their own hands at times and dump it on lots and dump it next to trash cans and any other place they can find it other than their homes because they can't find a place to store it. Um, you think about a family of two, three, four, or even five that's living in a household and how much trash they can generate in a given week if they don't have a place to store it 
unfortunately, some people dump it. And so we're trying to address those issues by giving them a direct service right into their communities and neighborhoods to ensure that they have adequate, adequate trash collection. Not only will this serve the residents that live in these situations, it will cut down on the amount of litter and illegal dumping that you just explained in our lots and our communities. So we're working with CLIP, we're working with licensing and inspections, we're working with uh, the water department, and PPR, and all of the departments across to address these strategies holistically. Uh, you, Mayor Parker made it very clear in her address that this was a top priority in her administration and we're already taking action to address those issues uh, with the Community Appearance Index. In our 100-day action plan, we're establishing a clean and green cabinet that will also provide the best recommendations and best practices on how we should clean and green our communities. Thank you. And now I'd like to call up our uh, police commissioner, Kevin Bethel, to answer your questions around our public safety plan. I just want to say for the record, Mr. President, um, Member O'Neill and Member Driscoll are no strangers to the training academy. And one of the issues was how do we ramp up to get to that 400 number based on current configurations of training. So thank you for that question, Councilman. Um, so first and foremost, when I came in the door, I, I could be no, uh, more proud of the men and women and what they've done, uh, working with OHR and working with our internal uh, uh, folks uh, in human resources. Uh, we're now on a cadence of bringing in anywhere from, we're pushing for 50 men and women every six weeks. On average, we're doing about 35 to 40 now. Uh, we will have uh, roughly 218 officers coming out this year, uh, and that does not include the officers that continue to come in and moving into next year. And, and so we're really, really uh, uh, excited about where we're going in that direction. Um, we will get to our numbers. One of the things I can share with you, most of the officers that we are losing are in our special units, not in our frontline patrol. Many of them are younger. And so we believe over the next couple of years, we will be able to bolster our districts back up to their staffing numbers. We'll lower, our, we'll come down in our special units, those particular units that need much more resources, our special victims, homicide, we will keep them at their higher levels, but we will start to retreat in our support areas as we build out our patrol assets again. Uh, but I could not be more proud of, of how they've been able to do the cadence. Uh, we believe with the, and that does not even include the work that many folks have, have done already around our, our standards. Uh, we are seeing some differences now, particularly with the physical fitness. I know uh, Adam is working with uh, uh, Director, um, I mean, Chief of Safety, uh, Adam Gear is working on the test. Uh, once we get that test in place, we think we'll also get a lot more candidates, uh, but we're definitely in a better position than we probably have ever been as it relates to getting the men and women in, getting them processed quickly. Uh, we're going to a paperless system now so we're able to move very efficiently now where we didn't have those efficiencies before. Um, and uh, we're, in, we're in a very good place and we're definitely we're going to hit the mayor's objective of getting to 400 and plus to, as we go into not this year, but going into next 2025 as well. Good stuff. Okay, thank you, sir. And as Dr. Carrera comes up uh, to your question regarding uh, the nation's first municipal college, we're really excited about the partnership with the School District of Philadelphia, the Community College uh, of Philadelphia, as well as organizations like Philadelphia Works in partnership with our dynamic Office of Human Resources under the leadership of Mike Zacagny and of course Camille Duchesse, who leads, uh, who is our new Chief Administrative Officer. We've had a number of programs, very successful programs like Future Track and the CAT program uh, in Parks and Recreation. Also Aviation does a lot of work around workforce development as well. But we've seen these, these programs work in silos. With the, with the School District of Philadelphia and with the Community College of Philadelphia. What we want to do is to break down those silos. We have a framework already in place. We've already um, identified programs of study that we can stand up this fall where we can create a pipeline to employment guaranteeing uh, uh, employment to the people that successfully, uh, young men and women that successfully completes this program. Dr. Carrera can provide more information uh, regarding what's happening currently with the city's first municipal college and then questions around those areas of study, um, I can, I'd like to call up uh, Camille Duchesse, our new CAO. 
Good morning, Councilman Good morning. Thomas. So as a former high school principal, this is exciting for me. And as a high school principal in North Philadelphia, um, this is extremely, I wish I had it back then. And so um, as, as our chief just said, the mayor does see CCP as a critical partner uh, in achieving her vision for economic um, opportunities. Uh, the five-year plan does provide a combined $255 million in CCP support for over five years, uh, $51 million per year, which is the total of 255, so roughly $40 million for operating, and then the $11 million for the Cato scholarship. $10 million this year, uh, $7 million of that, uh, those funds would go to the municipal college. And so CCP, the city, um, and the school district are gonna partner, as you've heard, the first in the nation uh, college for municipal employment, and the city college will enroll high school students. It's also gonna be uh, enrolling people who are looking for a change in career, and then also for current municipal workers who would like to advance in their careers. And so anyone that is interested in working in city government. And so the, the mayor's office of education is gonna work directly with the chief um, administrative officer to stand up this college um, and ensure that it's aligned with our current projected uh, workforce needs. Mr. President, I just wanna point out that um, that's how we fill those vacancies. Um, when we start to show, I think it was, uh, I forget which one behind me said, the way you fill it is show them how much they can make and what the opportunities are. I don't recall us ever laying anybody off. And so um, these pipelines from school to paycheck as opposed to school to prison are what we want to do. And then finally, Mr. President, I want to give you your kudos because not once has anybody said point of personal information under your watch. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Jones. The chair now recognizes Councilmember Cindy Bass. Thank you, Mr. President. Point of personal. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, just a couple of questions. Good morning. Good morning. Still morning. Good morning. Um, a couple of things I just really wanted to say. And the first is I wanted to thank um, the Philadelphia Police Department. I heard uh, Ms. Thurman as she said that public safety is the mayor's number one priority. Um, and it's important. It's very important. It's important not just in my district, it's important across the entire city of Philadelphia. Um, and as we work to attract business, to attract residents, to um, keep people here in the city, it's very, very important that they have a, a feeling of safety and security. And so I want to thank, um, start by thanking our police commissioner, but also I want to thank locally, on the local level, uh, our Northwest Inspector Nick Smith, and our 39th Captain, uh, District Captain Busa, uh, 35th Captain Burks, who is new and we welcome him, as well as the 14th Captain uh, McCollum, who is also new and we welcome him as well. Um, we just lost, um, as I call her, Mighty Maisha Massey um, from the Philadelphia Police Department, who was promoted. Um, so kudos to her as well. Um, did an excellent, excellent job and, and will be missed, but we look forward to seeing her on a citywide level doing significant work. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit about <laughs> this priority, um, because I know that uh, we just had the uh, loss of a young man, Damian Taylor, uh, who was 17 years old at M Hotel, leaving school um, in 20, that was in this year, 2024. In 2023, it was Devin Whedon, who was on his way to school at Gratz, who was gunned down going to school, uh, who was 15 years old. And the year before that, it was uh, Jeremiah Wilcox, who was um, playing with friends on a day off from school, who was 13 years old. And, um, you know, th like th these aren't just, you know, cases that happen. These, you know, families are attached, and whole neighborhoods are attached. And so I wanted to see how the mayor's number one priority was also connected to the neighborhood and community engagement budget, which I think really should go hand in hand. And when I saw the funding request for that particular office, I, I have to say I was a little bit surprised. I thought it was under budgeted based on the amount of need uh, in the neighborhoods and working directly with the police department. So I was wondering if you could speak to that. If anyone could speak to that. So 
So all of the engagement activity, whether it's the community engagement, the constituency engagement, we plan to work across city government. So that will lean on um, our police commissioner and the police department, but also working with um, P uh, Public Safety Director Adam Gear, so that we have a holistic, comprehensive approach. And with that, I'm going to call up Adam Gear to the table. who can talk a little bit more about his front office and some of the engagement roles and how they'll be engaging the community around public safety issues. Good morning, Council President. Good morning, Council Members. Good morning. Good to see you all. Good morning. Thank you for that question, Council Member. We, um, in my Office of Public Safety, really are going to be committed to bringing the community in um, in a very meaningful way. One of the positions that we will be creating internally is a new director of um, community violence interruption Mm -hmm. That position, which is a directorship position, will be um, dedicated right, to bring in these organizations, to bring in the community, to be a part of, of the solution. Mm -hmm. They're doing excellent, excellent, excellent work. One of the things that Philadelphia has is a robust group of criminal violence interruption mm -hmm. community groups mm -hmm. and organizations. Yes. So, so we absolutely mean to, to bring them in. We will also have a director of community partnerships mm -hmm. who will be coming in. That role, again, will be working with Mr. Hassan Freeman, who's under the mayor's office in the same role. When, uh, to, when do you think that'll fully be online? Because, you know, the weather's getting warmer, mm. summer is coming, you know, we're all getting very nervous. So when do you think that'll be online, that we'll actually be able to see, you know, some fruits from this tree? So we absolutely understand that, and we have the mm -hmm. same sense of urgency, mm -hmm. um, Council Member. We frankly just found that we would be able to internally fund these positions, so that's no longer, by the way, a part of our budget request, but once we went through this process, discovered that we could internally fund that, we have the job postings being written and they're gonna go out the door. Um, we also have some leads on some of those positions, so we are gonna be filling them and, and moving forward quickly. What's your target date? To fill those positions? Yes, and to be, and to be up and running. As soon as possible as soon as possible. So what day is that? <laughs> Once I can get a few more interviews, but, and, I, and I really mean that. We, I'm here with my first deputy, Evangela Manos, okay. and these are the conversations we're having um, in terms of filling these positions immediately so that we can get, because there's some wonderful candidates out there and Good. we want to get them working. And Good. I would just add so, um, that our, the engagement team in the meantime is already making sure that he, they work in, hand in hand with Adam. When we went to Imhotep, you saw blackmail engagement, you saw our director of engagement, our deputy director, Will Mega, all there supporting the public safety spectrum yes. across government. And they will continue to do that. And once Adam's full staff is, is, is on board, they will work hand in glove in partnership. So, so I, and I just want to be clear that we want to support you. Thank you. We want to support the work that you're doing. I think that we all, um, like I said, we're, we're very concerned about the upcoming summer months, what we've seen thus far, and we want to make sure that we can get in front of this. A couple of years ago, a group of us went to Trent, New Jersey, that, and, and we did a, a, a public safety tour, and they had an entire summer without one homicide. And Philadelphia, although much larger, does have a lot of similarities to Trenton. And if they could do it there, then I think that, you know, it's something that we can work towards here um, in, in a significant way. So we want to be supportive. I want to say that. Thank you. Councilman. Absolutely. Thank you. So I'm looking forward to hearing more information about that, like next week or so. I'm just kidding. Um, uh, another question for you. I wanted to go to talk about the triage and wellness facilities. Um, because that's another area, and I, I think when I took a look at the budget, one of the things I was looking at is making sure everything was right-sized, at least in my mind, and so I had some questions on things that I thought didn't seem like enough funding. And um, as I listened to the earlier questioning, and in the beginning I thought $100 million does not seem like uh, an adequate amount of funding for this uh, initiative, but then as I heard more questions and sort of rethought it, I thought, well, maybe maybe it actually is. And so one of the first questions I have is, um, as I was thinking through some of the questioning, um, is there a contact with the counties, the surrounding counties? Because you know, one of the things that in the previous administration, you know, like it was always kind of, you know, oh, these are all Philadelphians, and we know that there's a large number of folks who are drawn to Philadelphia because the quality of the drug 
is of the drugs are pure, better, you know, more desirable than in other places. So people come from all other places to Philadelphia, and particularly to Kensington, to be able to get high. And so knowing that, what kind of outreach have we done? I know that in the Nutter administration, there used to be um, sort of like a collective round table of um, the counties and the city working together on various issues. Are we doing that? Is, is that something that's on the table? Can you talk about that a little bit? Council member again, Adam Teal, the managing director. I think the short answer to your question about the amount of money and the proposed yes. amount of funding is it, it is a great start and we are absolutely looking to partner with all of our intergovernmental partners, uh, county, state, and federal level, and I'll turn it over to our, our Chief Deputy Mayor for more on that. Thank you, and with regards to um, that communication, as you know, Mayor Parker believes strongly in intergovernmental approach, um, and that's not just local, state, and federal, that's regional. So we've already been in contact with all of our Collar County partners. You might have seen that they signed on to a, um, a recent letter supporting our push for the increase in minimum wage. So we are going to every last Collar County to have a myriad of discussions around all of the issues that we share, whether that be the borders of you know, Bucks County and Philadelphia, Upper Darby, when you're talking about um, Delaware County and Montgomery counties. We know that some of the public safety issues spill out um, from, the, from the city to the suburbs, but also we see those issues come from the suburbs and into the, the city. So those are discussions, ongoing discussions that we are having at the executive level and um, meeting with all of our, our partners in the um, surrounding four collar counties in Southeast Pennsylvania. And actually across the Commonwealth, to be honest. Okay, thank you. I thought Councilman O'Neill was saying that he was signing up for a wellness site in the <laughs> uh, border in Bucks County. But he was mentioning New Jersey uh, also as you know a draw um, uh, uh, you know, uh, when we think about regional. So um, I'm looking forward to getting more information on that. Um, but I did want to go back to um, the question that Council President had. You know, like, I think everybody sort of like came to life when it was said that we, we would be uh, able to open up a wellness center within two weeks or so. And so, you know, you just can't drop that and, and, and leave us there. So we really do need as much information as that you have. If you think you can open something in two weeks, then you're further along than, than uh, you know, we might have thought otherwise. Council member, I think I, think I said weeks. Uh, so okay. not, not, not two weeks. Uh, Three weeks. Weeks, and <laughs> obviously, <laughs> Uh, something at the scale, you know, I, and, and we are looking to build a, a system. And something at that scale is going to take much longer than weeks. We know that we need to get started, so we're looking at phasing. So I think what we're talking about is our first triage facility we are aiming to open. Maybe I should have said as soon as possible, like my colleague. Uh, certainly weeks. And uh, please rest assured, though, uh, if we, as we get close to a location, we're not going to say, you know, hi, we're doing a ribbon cutting on Monday and it's Friday. So I think we can commit to you that we will make sure that we talk with the district council members and, and talk with council and make sure that you all know uh, where that's going to happen. And as we explore opportunities further, again, we're still in due diligence looking at a lot of different possibilities. And of course, we are open. We would love if you all have a potential uh, ideas or locations that we could activate in support of this uh, shared mission, uh, we'd love to hear about those too. So, um, but we, we won't do this at the last minute and, and well, let we, you know about it. I, I can tell you as a district member, I really do appreciate that because the word was on the street that there was a particular location in my district that was coming and I can't tell you the number of phone calls that I got. What's going on? What's happening? Is this real? You know, is this going to be, you know, like, um, coming, coming to a neighborhood near us sometime soon. And so I did speak with, I, I know Aaron, uh, we, we met the other day and talked about it, and Aaron assured me that, um, you know, like there, there would be weigh-in from the district council member um, basically following the lead of their constituents um, and making sure that, uh, you know, any changes to the, to the plan that would affect those community residents was thoroughly discussed 
uh, and approved really by the by the community and by the district council person. I don't know if you noticed, but all three of us just like grabbed the mic in the last few <laughs> seconds. And I know that we're all about to say the same thing. Uh, uh, Mayor Parker was a district council member yes. long before she became mayor. Yes. And so we understand the importance of coordinating mm -hmm. and, and collaborating with the district council member so there will be no surprises. Excellent. That's exactly what I wanted to hear. No surprises. Thank you very much. Um, the other question that I had was just around rebuild. And if you could talk about the new configuration of rebuild in your administration and the investment. Councilmember, appreciate that. I'm going to ask uh, our new director of our capital programs office, Aparna Palantino, to uh, approach the mic. And, and let me just say, as she's approaching, uh, I didn't know Aparna before she was appointed to this position, and, and CPO is in the managing director's office, and she is an absolute rock star. We're so happy to have her, mm -hmm. uh, not just to continue to work on rebuild, but to yeah. do all these other things that we're talking about. So We know this, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon, Council President, members of City Council, and thank you um, for that. I'm very appreciative of your faith in me. Um, and thank you for the question. Yes. Uh, Aparna Palantino, currently um, Deputy Commissioner of Parks and Recreation, um, soon to be head of the newly formed Capital Projects Office, which will incorporate capital divisions and capital staff from a variety of different departments, um, Rebuild being one of those. So as you know, um, in the last few years, we've both uh, at DPP and PPR, we've come up with new and innovative ways to accelerate projects, um, also not only for um, efficiency in time, but also to improve our efficiency and costs. Um, and one of the challenges we've found in Rebuild over the la last eight years, roughly, is that they are taking a lot longer um, mm -hmm than expected. I know the goal of Rebuild uh, was to accelerate projects uh, mm -hmm. compared to the standard capital process, but after eight years of sort of observing that, we found that that to not be the case. Um, so the goal is to bring Rebuild under the fold of this capital projects office and continue to implement projects in the way that we have been doing capital projects uh, citywide. Uh, one of the other um, aspects is, you know, Many council members know we've worked closely with each of your offices to prioritize investments in your districts. Um, the goal is Rebuild will come into those same conversations. You know, they will uh, side by side with other priorities in your district. Uh, we will make sure that those get implemented in the same fashion and be able to keep you more aware of those investments in your districts as well. Is, does Rebuild still have the same financial commitment from the uh, funders? Um, when it started out, it was a $500 million program. It was $300 million in um, um, city, city funds um, uh, through, through bonds. Um, it was $100 million through William Penn Foundation, I think, mm -hmm. and another 100 I think, in miscellaneous you know, uh, state and federal and uh, outside grants. Is it still that? Because I know that the numbers, like the, the goalposts kept moving under the previous administration. First it was 500 then it was, you know, 400, then it was 300, then it was 450. You know, like, it, it was all over the place. Right. Um, so what we have found over the last few years is that project costs have continued to increase uh, for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. um, after COVID, materials escalation went up, uh, with some materials up to 50%. So the initial estimates for projects, of course, have increased drastically. Yes. So that is a moving target. Um, the, uh, to speak to your question about the commitments of funding. Uh, those were what that program was anticipated to begin with, but we have since been seeking additional federal and state opportunities for adding funds to that. Um, and again, some of those conversations with your offices to prioritize where those investments should happen, in what order are, are key to doing that, because we uh, will also need your support to solicit those other sources of funding, along with the administration's. So did we receive those funds in? Did we ever receive those funds in from the, the you know, the William Penn Foundation? We have been continuing to receive funding from so, William Penn. Okay, mm -hmm. and from the other uh, entities that were originally listed as being funders, they, they have made those contributions? Yes, we have. We so, are. so what's this, do we know what the size of the budget is now for rebuild? 
Um, as it stands at this minute, yeah. um, and it can, of course, change, and it, it is very sure. dependent on what we get in private and federal and state sources, uh, it is somewhere between 400 and 550 million. Okay, because, and the reason that I'm asking is because, uh, you know, it's my opinion as a former chair of Parks and Recreation mm -hmm. that, um, that we needed every cent of that $500 million, Absolutely. and we need more. Mm -hmm. And so that didn't even do the job, and as we know, after COVID and you know, su supply chain shortages and everything else that was happening. Um, you know, we just didn't have enough. That We had whole projects, you know, I had a project in my district, and they were like, all right, well, you know, when it comes to the indoor basketball gym, we're just gonna build it, but we're not gonna put in the floor walls. And it's like, like you know, like that's not building Absolutely. it. You know, like that's not really um, doing what, what the community needs and what their expectations were from the very beginning. So, um, so just wanted to make sure that we're able to, you know, come through with these projects and also meet the funding needs and challenges based on the inflation and the cost of materials that have gone up significantly. Absolutely, and, and every site is critical. Um, you know, in my former role as Parks and Recreation, I know the condition of these facilities, and when they were evaluated, you know, they have only degraded since mm -hmm. that point. So those investments, those original estimates were certainly low, and as a result mm -hmm. of deferred maintenance, they continue to increase. Um, so I think, there are rebuild sites, but ultimately they are parks and recreation sites that have to be improved for our communities and our constituents. So we will continue to advocate for funding, um, whether it's under the umbrella of rebuild or just city facilities for our communities. So. Okay. And my last question was the Office of Minority Business Success. Um, that's another office that when I looked at the budget, the office budget looked very small. Um, compared to the work that I think it is required to undertake. Um, can, can that be something that you all are, it, it, you know, is this just initial funding? Do you plan on coming back later and asking for more? Or is this what it is? Is this what you think it should be? Because I, so, I, I don't have the number right in front of me, but I remember it was, it was uh, I think, a million or a million and a half dollars yeah, compared so to some other offices which were funded at a much higher rate. Yes, yes, ma'am. Uh, so we are focusing both on capital and equity investments mm -hmm. with, the, uh, with the Office of Minority Business Success. So under direct, uh, Director uh, Rachel Branson, she'll be working in close coordination across our departments, including our Commerce Department. So, it's, so while the, the funding is not in her direct budget, there is funding to support the work that Rachel and her team will be doing um, over the next administration, over the next fiscal year. Okay, all right. So more to come, we'll stay tuned. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you, and congratulations, Aparna, oh, on your thank promotion. You. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Mr. President. Councilman Nina Amai. Uh, thank you, Council President, and uh, thank you, everyone, for this amazing testimony. This is my maiden voyage, and I'm really excited to see how much promise we have in this budget. Uh, I do have a couple of questions. One is concerned about the projected fund balance, right? We, I think we all are. Uh, I wondered if we are optimizing our revenue stream, that's one, and two, are we anticipating growth and is that reflected in this um, projections that you have? And finally, to that point, are we looking at public-private partnerships, including uh, payment in lieu of taxes? Have we visited those options in terms of um, you know, uh, improving this scenario? Sure, and I will, I will talk about the assumptions, the growth assumptions in the plan, um, and then I'll turn it over to other people to talk about the public-private public -private partnership because we do have an office that is dedicated to that. So um, we work with an outside econometric firm to come up with um, our projections. Um, they give us draft projections. We take those down to a meeting at the Fed that's hosted by our oversight authority, PICA. Um, when our um, outside firm came to us this year, they were projecting much lower growth in revenues than we had seen last year um, for a couple of reasons. One, they um, are seeing inflation come down. So with inflation coming down, then wages come down too. Um, sales tax numbers will come down. Also, the growth in sales tax you know, would be slower. So um, because of that, and then their view that um, job growth will also slow. Um, we were looking at like $300 million less in revenue o over the plan. 
Um, so it, there is some growth assumed, but much lower than we had anticipated last year. So that was something that we had to build into this five-year plan, and that's why you know, part of the reason you're seeing the low fund balances at, at the back end um, for the public higher partnership. Should we? Yes. Um, uh, bring up coffee. Is that okay? Um, coffee here. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, Council Member, one of the other big new programs that we're really excited about is the Office of Strategic Partnerships. Oh, sorry. One of the offices that we're really excited about is the Office of Strategic Partnerships. Through that office and the leadership of Kathy Lindsay and uh, uh, Darnell uh, Thomas, who is her deputy, um, they're going to be exploring partnerships with the philanthropic community with the business community, with community groups, to figure out ways to both maximize opportunities for capital investment in the city, as well as direct partnership to expand and to, uh, to expand the bandwidth of what we are able to do as a city by including all of our civic partners who have skin in the game, who want to have skin in the game. This is actually born from the mayor's experience as she was going around and talking to people in every pocket of every community, whether it's, it's phil philanthropies with hundreds of millions of dollars to spend, to small neighborhood groups who were saying, we just want to be more involved. And we developed this under the leadership of Mayor Parker as a way for all of them to have a conduit into city government to be able to give whatever they have to be involved and to, to, for us to help them realize how they can be strategically aligned with each other and with the goals of the city. So I, was that all of your questions? I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, so that's prospective, correct? Yeah. So you don't have a sense of what that could look like in terms of how we can anticipate building out programs and delivering services oh. uh, with this added public-private partnership, or do you have a number in mind, is there somewhere you're going with this that you can say we are you know, anticipating X, Y, or Z? Yeah, so we're right now in the process of figuring that out, of developing those relationships, of seeing where there's alignment between the strategic goals of a lot of these partners and the goals of the city government to, to start to put some of this on. In some ways there will be a, a dollar return on investment, in some ways there will be a human resource return on investment, in some ways there will just be a collaborative expansion of the ability to do things return on that investment. We're not quite ready to, to put the numbers to it yet, but we're getting there, we're get, having all of the, uh, the pieces in place. So we expect to see a, a matrix of who, what, where, when. That, that's, and how much. And, yes, <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, I wanna switch quickly to another topic, uh, which we have heard a lot about is the triage centers. Um, the 100 million is a capital budget category, if, I'm, if I understand it correctly. What is the operating budget for these triage centers and which departments will be tasked to connect to those uh, uh, operational uh, issues around triage centers. Council Member, Council Member Adam Teal again, Managing Director. That's correct. The hundred million dollars is the uh, proposed initial capital investment, and the uh, operating investment right now, or the operating fund uh, wraparounds, we expect to come from uh, existing city agencies and and their and their budgets and their staffing, and uh, you know we. As we start to align with potential partners to operate this, we'll get a better sense. You know, obviously, the short answer to that is it, it depends. You know, how, how much operating we need depends on how many facilities of what type, what type of care are we going to be operating. So that is all still very much under development, too. We work very closely with our partners from the budget office uh, to make sure as we start to understand what that is, where funding that's not currently in the city's budget uh, is needed for operations that we're able to, uh, to find that, tap into that. And I think to your earlier point, we are definitely looking at partners who can bring that 
uh, through some of these partnerships and strategic partnerships. So I can assure you, you know, we're, we're having meetings with folks. It's not just about the services. It's about, you know, looking for folks who are willing to partner with us and, you know, bring their own resources to this uh, shared mission. Uh, where does the opioid settlement money feature in this, and where is it, and what is the amount, and what is going to change when there's more settlements? We have no sense of where does it reside. Councilmember, that's a, a really complicated question. We'd, we'd probably want to walk you through that during a future, you know, one of the agency level briefings on that, or the MDO briefing. We can, we can tell you what the settlement fund was before, and then as we're working on the, the future plan. I think it is important to mention that is done in concert with the community. So uh, going forward, that's, that's part of it. So I think we, that will take a, a lot of time to walk through that, and we'd like to come back to you with discussion uh, And the about final that. question I have on this is location of these triage centers. I heard something, and maybe I could be wrong, that the Hahnemann space was considered for something. Is that a fact? And it, is there a possibility of having that as our uh, rehabilitation center so you know, it doesn't impact any residential neighborhoods in any way? Council member, again, to reiterate the prior commitment, if, if we are getting close to operating uh, triage or wellness facilities in uh, any of your council districts, we will be sure to, to let you know well in advance of that. There is a little bit of confusion, I think, about uh, Hahnemann, you know, and I'll put that in, in, yeah. in quotes. There are a lot of properties that folks typically think of as being part of the Hahnemann complex. Uh, there's a, a property that folks think of as part of that complex that we recently uh, were able to do a, a deal. This is a, a long-standing uh, negotiation for some Office of Emergency Management space as well as some space to uh, relocate an existing family shelter operation. It is not, you know, that is an arrangement that we've been working on for a long time that is not uh, one of the triage or wellness sites. So I think there's been some, some confusion about that. We are looking at a lot of different possibilities and locations. And again, you know, I think we've heard very, we've heard from a lot of you the need for this. And you know, we have to put these facilities you know, in our city to take care of folks who are in our city. So uh, we do hope that if you have locations that you think might be suitable, you'll let us know. We will let you know as we get through this uh, due diligence uh, where we're thinking to start uh, achieving this bold vision. Thank you, and I look forward to a more detailed explanation on the issues that were just mentioned. Thank you. Thank you. At, at this time, we want to take a um, brief recess um, and then come back, members have to f finish up their first round, and then we'll go into our second round, and then also questions for the mayor's office budget as well as the Department of Labor. Uh, we will be coming back at... one fifteen. Meet us back here promptly, and we get started and finish out the rest of our day.